Good evening everyone and welcome to my live stream. Let's just get this microphone ready and we can go. So today's live stream is going to be about how to get into hacking. And uh, yeah, um, this is a question which has been asked almost on every stream on which I had both in English and I think in Polish. So uh, it was asked in usual, usually in different forms, like how do I get into security research? How do I get into reverse engineering? How do I get into uh, hacking altogether? So I decided that maybe I should actually spend one live stream talking about it. So this live stream isn't going to be as technical as usually my live streams are. It will be a little bit softer than usual, uh, but uh, this will also be an opportunity to chat with you folks, everyone who is on the chat right now, and answer some of your questions. I have some speaking notes prepared. I will chat about that, and then we can also try to address the questions which you might have. And I already saw on the live, uh, sorry, on the chat, but there are some questions. Now, today's moderator is going to be Krzaku. You can see his nickname right here. So if you have any questions and you are on our YouTube chat or on our Discord, I guess, it's best that you write, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, like at sign, then Krzaku, and then the question. That way Krzaku can give me the question, like actually copy paste it into our, um, well, question table, let's call it like a, we, we have a website where we post all the questions which we use internally so I can then address the question. Now, uh, and you can actually see it displayed here. If you're on our IRC though, you can use exclamation mark Q and ask a question. If you're on our Discord, you can do the same but then your nickname will not show up because of reasons. So uh, yeah, that's the way to communicate. So thank you, Kshaku, for being here. I also expect a couple of our mo other moderators to show up since I see they were pretty active on the chat. Uh, probably Foxtrot will show up at some point. So um, hello as well. Cool. So what are we going to chat about today? Well, uh, first, let's start with my moderators, as usual, uh, which would be, as mentioned, Kshaku, dev.kshaku.cc. Take a look at his website. And also, as I've mentioned, probably Foxtrot will show up, so foxtrotlabs.cc. This is probably a QR code that you can also use to, to just go to his website, uh, which is a smart thing to do. I need to remember to add that to myself. Now, usually I answer the questions, how do I get into hacking? How do I get into security? Uh, saying that, hey, look up the post, uh, a blog post by either Parisa Tabris or El Kamtaf, Michał Zalewski or um, Ivan Fratrik. So uh, I'm going to give you these links immediately. They will also, during the live stream, they will also show up here, like you can see them. Um, they're pretty long, but if you make a screenshot, yeah, you can make it work. So let's start with giving the links. I'll read the links, uh, like read these blog posts. These are super smart people. Parisa is the head of, uh, I guess, like Chrome Security Project Zero and so on. Uh, she also was my manager and my colleague in, in the team for uh, some time, for a couple of years. And like, I think super highly of her. She's absolutely amazing. And she's written a lot of good stuff here. So take a look at that. Uh, then there's Al Kamtaf, who is like the Polish hacking legend, basically, uh, who was also my colleague at, at the team uh, and also my boss for for sometimes he's also one of the people when I basically read his book that was really eye-opening on how to get into security research so I also recommend whatever uh, checking whatever he has on his blog uh, so this is the second link here we go and then there is uh, Ivan who was also in my team and then moved to project zero uh, he's a really renowned researcher security researcher so uh, take a look at as well Ivan is like super smart so I also recommend doing that. Now, it turns out that actually Mubix, who is uh, a pretty amazing researcher himself, uh, like, yeah, absolutely, uh, he also made a list of all these things. So uh, all, all, of all these blogs and additional blogs, so I'm just going to give it the, the link to you as well so you can later catch up on reading. Like, um, what I'm trying to say here is, uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you and do the best I can, but Please also check out other perspectives and there isn't one way how to get into hacking. There is like, you have to do this, this and this. No, it's not like that. There are a lot of ways you can get into hacking and as I'm going to later point out, this is basically an interdisciplinary science so or even applied science. So uh, 
and it's like a super huge area. So there are multiple ways you can get into hacking. Multiple people who are like super successful as hackers, as security professionals, have uh, their own perspective, how they got here, how they, um, yeah, and like what they recommend doing, what they think you should do instead of doing what they did as well sometimes since, you know, uh, we, we're just humans, we don't always take the most optimal path. In the end, uh, take a look at everything, where everything, like, hear me out, and then, like, think for yourself. This is like a keyword for hacking. You have to think for yourself. You have a brain somewhere here, so uh, it should be possible. Cool. Um, I see there are already some questions, but I'm going to, I guess, start with... Um, oh, uh, I see Foxtrot also gave me another link, which I should take a look at, uh, for, from... Uh, Checkpoint Research, which is also an excellent link. I'm going to show it to you now, and then I will also share it with you. This is yet another perspective, which you can take a look at. Uh, yeah. Want to learn about exploitation? Exploitation is part of the hacking. It's not everything, so... Uh, but it, it is also a really popular, I would say, avenue of hacking. Now, um, what shall we talk about. Uh, let's start maybe from a couple of like, in general, like what is hacking, right? Uh, since I guess everyone here already knows, but um, just to repeat the obvious, uh, there are multiple definitions of hacking. Like, first of all, a hacker might be a taxi driver. Like in some parts of the world, you call a hacker, a hacker is, a, is your cab driver, basically. It wasn't super popular, but it is in the dictionary. So let's uh, move on from that. Um, there's basically different definitions of hacker if you ask the media, like if you read the mainstream media, right? Or not even mainstream, just the media, uh, or what you hear in popular language, in the language used every day by uh, like people who are not in IT. And that would be usually a cyber criminal, right? Like somebody who is doing harm for, the, uh, for their own good or just for the laws uh, and are like uh, usually not doing it lawfully. Well, that's basically a definition uh, of a criminal. And this isn't really a definition which I'm going to use, which I care much for. Um, this is like, yeah, like it's same like if, you know, theory in science and theory in the everyday language. These are like different things. So same with hackers. Uh, let's, let's not even talk about that definition. Then there are two more definitions. One which is used among programmers, I would say, and like also people who are really deep into making and to electronics. Um, where a hacker is basically like uh, to hack on something is basically to work on your own project and hackers are basically people who are super good, super knowledgeable in the given field. So for example, uh, Linux who made the Linux kernel is uh, considered a hacker and rightfully so. Obviously we are talking about the hacker as a programmer uh, even though there are some, um, there were some funny articles where confused journalists uh, thought that him being called a hacker means he was like he had a shady background of hacking into systems, which was like obvious. Uh, yeah, they, they, they were just clueless in that case. So, um, yeah, so there is that definition. And this definition is actually surprisingly close to the one related to security because at the end of the day, a hacker is a person from like our perspective, right? From the perspective of people who are in security, a hacker is a person who has enough knowledge to be able to break into systems. Do they do it for good? Do they do it for like uh, their own gain? Doesn't matter. It's a like neutral definition. So yeah, it's like it covers everything. Uh, so like reverse engineering, it could be done for good. It could be done for more like uh, someone's own gain. Uh, so same with hacking. And uh, but at the end of the day, hacking usually, uh, especially like top class hacking, requires a lot of knowledge and a lot of knowledge from really different fields. So that's what I said at the beginning, that this is like an interdisciplinary applied science, because um, if this isn't one thing, one piece of knowledge which you need to learn. You usually need to learn a lot of things. And uh, then you are able to, from that, you are able to basically look at parts of a system and figure out... Uh, how they work and what's missing there and what's broken there and so on. So this is the hacking I'm going to talk about. Hacking as in breaking into computers, um, into computer systems, into networks and so on, and uh, the skills required for that and also everything related. For example, um, 
analysis of uh, after someone broke into a system where people who are analyzing the the logs doing forensics analysis, they are also like absolutely hackers. Uh, people who are trying to defend against hackers, uh, they need hacker knowledge as well because you cannot defend against something if you have uh, no idea how it's done, right? So like uh, people who are defenders, these are like absolutely hackers as well. So not only the offensive side uh, are hackers, like everyone who has enough knowledge is. That's basically how it works. Now, another thing which is commonly associated with hackers is the curiosity, uh, like being curious about how things work, how operating system works, how application works. And it's not like, how do I use it uh, as the author intended, but how does it actually work? Does it actually do what the author wants it to do? Uh, how deep can I go to understand every single piece, piece of it, which is uh, interesting for me. So, um, and yeah, and if you actually read, for example, the Hacker Manifesto from, what was it, 86, 85, something like that, uh, then uh, curiosity is also like mm, a big part of that manifesto. Uh, things have actually progressed from that, like in, in these times, the manifesto was all about hackers being kids who are like way above, way smarter than the average and are like their curiosity is pushing them into exploring the networks. Um, and they are like the manifesto is about um, that these kids are being called criminals why they actually from their perspective are absolutely like a product of a system which is just curious and we moved a long way from there like what 35 years have passed and currently like a lot of people are working as uh, security professionals, meaning they're just hackers who are trying to defend systems, hackers who are trying to break into the systems they're trying to defend, like red teams. And yeah, so we, we've gone a long way. But um, I don't think uh, like even after these many years, there's still not one way to get into hacking. Uh, yeah, so an important part about hacking, even before we get into more, um, more technical stuff, is there are two more things like ethics, because I did say hacking, hack, a hacker being a hacker is a neutral term, right? Uh, there might be black hats who are more about, uh, you know, breaking into the system for their own or somebody else's gain. And then there is, uh, there are like white hats who are more about working with the system owners to protect the systems and working with software, um, like creators to make the, the software secure. Uh, but, uh, I'm going to probably focus on the latter part, like on, on the white hats, on the people who are going, uh, thinking about security as a way, as a career basically, and as a hobby, and not as something to greatly benefit yourself in, in a really short time as, as might be the other direction of going. Um, so ethics here plays a lot of, uh, quite a lot, uh, like a, a big role, I would say. And there are a couple of things which you need to remember, for example, never break into a computer system if you do not have an explicit permission from the system owner to do that. And if you have that explicit permission, you have to remember what uh, what's the limit of this permission, like how far can you go? Can you actually, uh, like for example, if you break into successfully, can you start reading user data? Um, everything would be usually discussed with the system owner. If you are the system owner, well, yeah, like it's your system, you can do what you want. If somebody else is the system owner um, and you're, for example, doing a pen test uh, for them, a penetration test, then that's a, that's a different thing. But do remember, you need explicit permissions. And this is to protect you um, and them as well. As in, uh, the law is the second thing, which is, which, like, I guess we went into. You can get in trouble with hacking. And, uh, and that really depends on multiple factors. You have to be kind of careful to do it, but you, there is a line which you can walk and you can be relatively safe. Uh, for example, I didn't, I was never sued or like didn't ever get any, had any law problems. Uh, so you can absolutely do hacking without getting in trouble with the law, but you do know, you do need to know the law. So for example, uh, I, I like reading law and I did re read like certain, you know, acts and so on for the country where I was living in. Uh, and like the country I might be interested in doing work for, for example, because this is the important part, like the internet is like a global network, right? So which means like you can be sitting here, wherever that here is and do work for a country, which is somewhere else. 
And the problem is that uh, which law applies to you and uh, the answer isn't really clear and it's not always clear. Like for example, the, um, if you're breaking into a system which is somewhere else, like you're doing a pen test for a system which is in a different country, which law applies to you and the answer might be both laws. Uh, it might be even that even a law of another country where the server is located, not the company, but the server is located. So you have to be mindful of that and you kind of have to know where is the boundary which is uh, which the law says is fine to do things. Usually the boundary is that if you have the permission, you can you can hack stuff. Um, that's like a bottom line. So if you created something, you can hack it. If you own something, you can hack it. If you have explicit explicit permission from an owner, you can hack it. Bug bounties are an, a great example of that. Bug bounties are basically like the programs made by companies, like not not, not a software, more like a, a, a part of activity by a company where you can try to hack the company in under the terms they say, and they give you rewards for that quite nice rewards like i know there are some people doing a uh, really nice living out of these rewards so uh this is a, a, a bug bounty verse like usually written what do you have permission to do and if you're going on your own uh, then yeah absolutely know the law read the acts uh, read the like you know the codexes and so on uh, if you and um this isn't so scary as you think especially especially that the law is written in a way that um, is really similar to technical documentation at the end of the day. Uh, do remember, however, that the law does not, is not a computer program. Therefore, uh, you need to consider what was the intention of creating this law and how will a potential judge interpret the law. Uh, so it's not like in a vacuum. It's not a computer program. That's not how the law works. Uh, when in doubt, always chat with a lawyer. L lawyers are expensive, but learn to hire lawyers in case, especially when you're going into a professional le level, um, it's good to sometimes ask a lawyer, hey, like, how legal is this thing? Would it get me in trouble? Because you have a lot to lose. So just don't do that. So yeah, uh, try to be ethical, basically, and try to follow the law to not get into trouble. And you can absolutely practice hacking uh, and get quite, make a really nice career out of that without um, getting into trouble. That's basically what I was trying to say. Now, um, I guess we can chat a little bit about uh, okay, so I'm, I've said already a couple of times that this is that hacking is basically interdisciplinary science, right? Uh, applied science. What does that exactly mean? That means that usually people do not start from zero and go into hacking. That's usually no, not how it happens because hacking requires quite a lot of knowledge. So uh, you get there step by step. You usually learn multiple different things and you get into a place where you have enough knowledge from different areas to be able to reason about larger parts of software, larger parts of computer systems, of computer networks, and then you can start reasoning about them and analyzing them. So um, yeah, you cannot like just start, yeah, I like, I know how to use a computer, so I want to be a hacker. Uh, I mean, you can do that, but you will have to learn all these things. And what are these things? That kind of depends where you want to end up with. Like this is usually when my answer begins on the live stream, like, um, what do you want to do in security? Do you want to, for example, handle the defense of large networks? Do you want to be an offensive vulnerability researcher? Do you want to uh, focus on web security or on mobile security? Do you maybe want to focus only on kernel exploitation or firmware or actual hardware security? These are like different paths uh, which you might want to take. And what I'm going to say now should be adjusted to where you want to go. And... Um, let me actually mark one more talking point. Okay, so um, if you want to, I'm going to assume for the sake that you want to actually be able to hack a computer system. And again, we are talking about legal hacking, ethical hacking here. So you have permission and or you actually own the system. So, or you need to protect, again, protect like against something like that. So you need to have this knowledge. Uh, so that's what I'm going to uh, talk about now. Um, what you need to do is you basically need to understand the software stack of uh, what you are analyzing. So if you want to get into web security, you need to understand how websites work, how they are created. The best way to do it is go and create websites. Create the uh, user site first, which would be like HTML, then add some JavaScript after you know HTML. HTML is obviously like just like the form of what is displayed. It doesn't, it's not a programming language even. Uh, adding J JavaScript to that 
that's programming. So you are starting to learn programming as well. Programming is super important. I will get to that later. Um, then there is also learn how, how does it happen that you enter a page, like you enter some address in the browser and you are suddenly on the website. How does that happen? There are networking protocols which are at play there. There is the DNS protocol. Uh, then there is the HTTP protocol. There is the encryption probably using SSL. There is the um, like TCP, IP. There is a lot of reading just to understand how that simple website works. How does it happen that a simple website in HTML which you've created, posted on some server, how does it happen that it actually is then rendered on your on your screen. So learn that. This is like the hacker way basically that you need to understand in depth uh, what you what you want to reach, like the point you want to reach. How deep should you go into the networking protocols? Try to understand them, give, give or take understand them. And uh, if something is the focus, the main focus of what you want to uh, dig into, like spend most time there. But yeah, do not neglect other things which allow you to understand the main objective better. Um, so yeah, when you continuing web security, then uh, like knowing already JavaScript, you already can start learning about XSS, which is the cross-site um, scripting, which is one of the basic attacks. And this is where we get to actual hacking attacks, right? And um, like even even like with this simple website and the, some networking protocols, you can already learn about men in the middle. You can learn about some basic network attacks. You can learn about some basic web attacks like XSS. You can learn about XSRF. Um, so there are there is basically a list of classified types of attacks for a given thing or vulnerability classes or back classes, whatever you want to call them. For website uh, websites, if you go to OWASP, like Open uh, Web Applications Security something, um, then there is the OWASP top 10 or OWASP top 10, however you want to call it. But the list of top 10 vulnerabilities related to uh, that are found on websites and that's what you what you should learn. You should learn each of the classified vulnerability because, uh, and this is important, vulnerabilities are not restricted to these which, which have been classified. A classified vulnerability is basically a vulnerability which appears quite commonly in the wild, in the wild meaning on some websites, and that it's frequent enough that it actually got its own name. Like for example, cross-site scripting. This is a classified vulnerability. If I say XSS to another security researcher, they absolutely know what I'm talking about. And uh, there are multiple of these types of vulnerabilities, like XSRF, cross-site request forgery is another right, and uh, another one, um, like or XS search, cross-site search. And uh, you have to learn the basics, meaning you have to learn the, these types of vulnerabilities. How do they work? How to exploit them? How to protect against them? Uh, learn each of these steps because once you learn how to protect against them, there will be a next step: how to bypass the protection and then how to protect against this bypass. And then another step, how to bypass this protection against the bypass so you can actually, um, you can actually exploit the vulnerability. So, and, and this is like digging deep. It's always a rabbit hole, which you fall down into. Like you start learning about XSS and then you suddenly are like, yeah, like uh, 10 weeks in and you say, like there's, there has a lot of work been done in this field. And that's true. Uh, we live in a complicated world, but that's okay. Like if uh, if you like hacking, if you like security, you will have fun along the way. Uh, quite a lot of fun at, uh, at that. So after you know that, then comes for web security, there would come the server side, which is like the server, which actually is doing some work, some logic and rendering the website, which is then sent to the client. Uh, this is usually, PHP is usually the first target because it's the easiest uh, as in, um, because because of why PHP was created and how it was created and when it was introduced and how many bad tutorials were created which show bad code patterns, there were and still are a lot of websites which have really simple vulnerabilities. So PHP is usually what you learn first uh, and uh, as a server-side language. I guess currently JavaScript is gaining popularity there. So if you know client-side JavaScript, you will be able to also jump into server-side uh, a lot easier than that was the case in the past. But there are also other languages. Um, so yeah, then you dig into server-side and then on the server-side, there is usually you start um, 
getting into like typical logic, business logic vulnerabilities and also applied cryptography is starting to play a role there. Applied cryptography isn't like crypto analysis. Crypto analysis is trying to break an algorithm, like somebody proposes an encryption algorithm or a hashing algorithm and uh, or like some other kind of cryptographic key exchange algorithm. And um, and you are trying to, in crypto analysis, you are trying to find the math way to uh, to actually uh, break the algorithm. This is not applied cryptography. Applied cryptography is more about um, like somebody has this implementation of a cryptographic algorithm and they are using it in this way. Can I do something weird with the way they are using it? So this is what usually hackers focus on unless they're like really good at math and really like uh, crypto analysis when they go into a crypto analysis as well. But you can uh, get quite a lot of there's like a lot of fun stuff in applied cryptography and it is not as hard as you might imagine. It's actually a little bit, it's uh, surprisingly simple, I would say like that. Especially like if you dig down into the concepts, it's surprisingly simple. Um, you will also get to know the the fruits of the work of crypto analysts. Like uh, for example, like if there's a RSA and the implementation uses it like that, you will see how the algorithm might be broken in some cases. So um, this is also something to learn. You need the knowledge in your head. You need to also have a hands-on knowledge. Um, and yeah, and having knowing that and also getting more into business logic and natural extension of that would be going into um, like lower the stack, lower through the stack. You start to do the web, then you get the server side web, and then there are like system core system services or like desktop applications almost on the same level. So you can learn that if it's, if it's what you like, you can go lower, you can uh, go into the system uh, internals, into the kernel, into the drivers, into the firmware at the end, and then into hardware hacking. Uh, but uh, that's like the easiest progression, I would say, to go over. You can immediately start with firmware or drivers. It's just like a different path. And again, it's up to you. There is no one sure way to do it. It's like what amuses you the most? What do you have the most fun with? And for each of these like web security exploitation, uh, exploitation meaning usually low level exploitation or like mobile security or crypto analysis, there, is, there are separate resources to learn from. Um, now, one important thing is uh, do not try to learn from one resource. What you have to learn first is how to learn, which is sounds quite funny, but that's how it is. And again, there is no one single solution. For every person, this will be different. For me, I like to learn from various different resources, have different resources opened, but do things manually. So I'm trying to do things manually, and I'm just getting from these random resources, uh, trying to get the knowledge which I need to make the next step and the next step and the next step, but I'm still doing everything manually and just learning what I need as I go. Um, this isn't easy if you do not have a lot of uh, previous experience, because if you have previous experience, you can use a lot of things by like analogy. And uh, because like at the end of the day, even like the code which you write on the browser side and the firmware, they have some common parts which are quite similar. Uh, they are quite different, but they also have some similar parts. So you can you do some stuff by analogy. If you have previous knowledge, you can use that. If you don't, then um, do not focus on one single resource. Try to find multiple resources. If you, for example, uh, the common question I get is like, what book would I recommend? And I, I'm not sure about this question because it kind of mm, suggests, and I might be wrong here, but the person who was asking about this is like wants to focus on that one book. I might be getting it wrong, but the thing is that get five books, like five different books, see five different perspectives, and then um, also find like 20 tutorials and five video tutorials mm -hmm. and maybe some other resources. Maybe there's like a live stream on, on the topic. Take a look at how the people who are doing it daily, how do they do it? And use all these resources. There is like, don't focus on one resource because usually so hacking is about details. And usually if you are in the search for details, you will there will be resources which omit this detail. So you will not find this detail here. You will not find this detail here. But oh, this actually on the live stream, the person mentioned it. Or like on this tutorial, somebody actually mentioned it. And this is what you, you are hunting down for. And another thing is always try to dig as deep as possible as deep as possible and understand what you are doing. This is key. You have to understand, like have a mental model of what you are doing at each step. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's true for like for everything. If you, for example, try to exploit an XSS, 
you have to know how the protocols work, how the HTML is rendered, uh, as in the server side, if it's rendering it, how, how does that work? How does templating work? And what do you want to achieve with the JavaScript which you inject? Because XSS is at the end of the day injecting JavaScript. So what, that, what should that JavaScript do? And how should it do it? So uh, always try to understand a lot about what you are doing. That's, um, yeah, because the devil is in the details. Hacking is all about the details. And um, yeah, another thing to note here is that uh, I guess I already mentioned the communication protocols. It's good to know some networking. You do not he have to be a networking expert unless you want to specialize in network security. There is quite a lot, like it's a separate, well, not really separate. It's like a, a world of, of its own network security and network protocols, especially on larger networks like. Uh, so mm, yeah, but you still have to know some basic communication protocols and also later on, inter-process communication protocols. So not only how networks work, what's an IP address, what's an uh, IP mask, uh, what, how does an IP packet look like, what's the difference between TCP and UDP, what are like, how does HTTP work, what's the difference between, I don't know, post request and get request. And uh, in, in all honesty, at the end of the day, if I would ask you, okay, write me a simple HTTP request, uh, this is like on a piece of paper, this is what you should be able to do. Um, how to learn these protocols? Learn the like read the specification. Uh, I already mentioned that reading the law is like reading the technical documentation. This is where the te technical documentation comes into play usually. It's usually the protocols. The protocols are written in the most like um, hard language, not easy to read type which you have to get used to and you have to get used to reading specifications. This is basically your daily bread and butter as a hacker. Uh, because you are looking in the specification for center, certain things at the end of the day which might be incorrect or which might be missing. Looking for things which are missing isn't easy. It's uh, easier to, think some, uh, to spot something which is broken than to find something which is not there. Um, yeah, and uh, also learn like how inter-process stuff works. Even if you do like web security and you start going into the, uh, the server side code, you will have to learn how processes chat with each other because usually websites, especially larger websites will do that. And that's also a daily bread and butter for if you're do doing like system security or if you are doing uh, low level exploitation. Uh, I already mentioned cryptography. Now let's go, go to programming, right? Programming is, it's a tool. Programming is a tool the same way that reverse engineering is for multiple areas in um, in security and the same way as analyzing how a net like analyzing a captured network traffic or analyzing a file uh, like with a hex editor these are tools which you use in hacking uh, and like even if you play with web apps only you usually need some of all these things especially programming so programming is your main tool because um, at the end of the day, the tools which exist will not be able to um, to give you much of a hand for what you need to do because they were created for a different purpose. There are a lot of tools which are pretty universal. And then there are a lot of tools which are excellent in doing a single thing. But you will more, more common than not find yourself in uh, like I'm missing a tool to do something. And this is why you need to understand what you are doing and why you need to know how to program. Because you will be able to create your own ad hoc tool to do the thing. And this is, at, from a certain point in your skill, in your level, you will be doing this a lot. You will be using more your own tools which you created than tools which exist. You'll be using like five tools which exist and then 15 tools which you have written, which are short, long, but they are still written by you for this specific purpose. This is why you need to learn programming. Now. Learning programming is a, is a different thing, um, like not, e not even a subject of this stream, but what I can recommend is I can recommend learning one language for general use, which is easy to use, has a lot of standard libraries, so you don't have to implement every protocol on your own, uh, and it's quite popular, so you can find quite a lot of help. My personal choice, Python, and that's a really popular choice. But if you like go for, I don't know, JavaScript or Ruby or whatever else, that's fine as long as you will not get stuck too often. Apart from that, from certain point, especially if you're going into low level exploitation um, or like, uh, yeah, but you will have to learn lower level languages like C, C++. 
and at some point assembly. Uh, there are like domain specific languages which you need to learn as well. If you're doing web security, that's going to be JavaScript for you. Uh, if you're doing server side part of, um, of web security, that's going to be, for example, PHP or Python or like Java, right? But you will have to learn that language, but you will not have to, you will have to be able to read it and understand it, but you will not have to be able to write in it. For writing, Again, one general language and then one language for writing things which have to be fast. It might be, for me it's C++, for you it might be Rust for, or Go or whatever, but doesn't matter. It just has to be la a language which, if you need to do something which like really efficiently, uh, then this is your tool. And these are tools. Another tool is reverse engineering. Now, reverse engineering is a topic um, of its own. It's again, like everything I'm mentioning is like a world of its own. So it's these are like... There's a huge research done in each of these um, areas and you will have a lot of fun learning stuff, especially after you go through the beginner's level, you will start to really appreciate every new detail, every new idea that the person had. And some of them are like super, super ingenious. So uh, yeah, like I, I really recommend trying to get through the beginner level and going upwards because there, you will have a lot of fun reading what other people do. Anyway, so reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is Long story short, reading other people's code. Um, usually reverse engineering is uh, like people think about assembly, about machine code, right? But that's not tr not really true. Reverse engineering is just about getting something and trying to understand how it works. That's reverse engineering. You will have to learn that. Uh, will you have to learn assembly? Maybe not. If you're like only going through web pages, and there is only Java, uh, sorry, JavaScript and some server side languages, you will just have to learn how to read them. That's reverse engineering. And um, uh, it's, obviously it's not only reading about it, but also trying to reason how it works and trying to reason based on that. So uh, there are different methods depending on um, different, I guess, programming languages. But at the end of the day, you need to learn to use the debugger. You need to learn how somehow to uh, browse through the code. It might be either for um, machine code or like uh, uh, Ghidra or Ghidra or like Binary Ninja. It might be just like Notepad Plus for um, or like Sublime or like Vim for any other language which is not which is not compiled and you get the source code. Uh, but you will have to do that. That is like super important. Now I actually have on my blog. Uh, a post about learning reverse engineering, so I can send uh, you that link. This is again a link which I commonly have, commonly share when I'm going to answer a question about how to learn reverse engineering. You go to my blog and you look for FAQ and there is how to learn reverse engineering. So uh, take a look, maybe you will find something there which actually, uh, which actually, well, gives you a hint how to learn it. There's also like it kind of focuses on assembly, but you might get ideas uh, how how to use this for different languages. Especially like, for example, if you are, even if you're like analyzing Python, but you find that the Python is compiled, you get a compiled Python package. How do you then reverse engineer that? If it has to run on a computer, uh, it can be analyzed. That's basically the, mm, that's basically that. Now, uh, this is again a tool. Reverse engineering is not a goal on itself. In hacking, it's a tool. Programming reverse engineering. Then we get to analyzing network protocols, uh, which is like, if you are dealing with network stuff, you need to be able to use tools like Wireshark and usually whatever browser there is, uh, modern browser which can show you HTTP packets. And on top of that, you knowing how to use an HTTP proxy is also useful, like for example, Burp or Zap or Fiddler, which I personally prefer. So these are like tools which show you the protocol. Um, like and try to dissect it and try to give feed you the data in a human readable form. Now, without knowing how the protocol works, without reading the specifications, the tool itself is is useless. It will not give you anything. You have to learn the protocol to be able to use the tool, and uh, keep that in mind. And it's quite quite common to you know to like first open the tool and then start reading the specification to see what is what and um, and trying to understand like piece it in your head. Uh, this, uh, so yeah, keep that in mind. And this is also a common thing to do, analyzing network protocols and also creating sometimes small scripts, small tools, which intercept a given protocol and change something in between and post the packet for the, like a simple proxy tool. This is also another common tool. 
Uh, when we get to uh, the last thing which I mentioned is basically file files because you deal a lot of with files, especially if you're going into low level exploitation, um, you will be dealing a lot with files. Files and protocols, especially binary protocols, binary files are similar but different. Uh, you, you need part of the same knowledge to understand them, but they work in a little different form. A file is usually a contained, a contained thing while a protocol is uh, something which is being, it's a conversation usually, which is being sent and they're like timestamps. This is not, not in a file, but if you like grab a single part of a protocol and look at the binary data there and look at the file and the structure, these are like similar concepts, super similar concepts. So if you can like start analyzing binary protocols, then you will easily jump into analyzing file formats and the other, the other way as well. Um, this is useful because a lot of bugs are in analyzing in reading the files in the file reader code. So the code opens a file and then it needs to read the data in into a way uh, into structures which can be processed by code which is uh, somewhere else. And there are a lot of bugs there and I'm seeing like a lot especially uh, like video formats uh, or like image formats these are like or PDFs these are like known for having literally thousands of bugs in the implementations. So this is usually where if you're interested in low level exploitation, you will get um, to know a hex editor really well. But apart from knowing hex editor, also know, try to learn um, how to create your own um, interpreters for the file where you feed a file and uh, it will give you like human interpretable data about that file. So uh, that's uh, one good exercise. Another exercise is the other way around, right? You want to, for example, create a test PNG image, write a program, an ad hoc tool, which uh, just creates a whatever image. And um, another trick which usually I use and also Korkami uses is we use assembly compilers, like assemblers, to create files. Not in assembly, but you can use the assembler itself. You can abuse it to create um, to create files, I can even show you an example, I guess. Um, uh, um, uh, if I actually find it, here we go. Mm, but that's not it. Okay, here we go. So yeah, this is using an assembly. This is, as you can see, like bits 32, this is, this code normally would be assembly, but it's not. It's just exporting some data and it's exporting data, it's using labels. There are no assembly instructions here. It's just exporting data using the DW, DD, DB, and so on. And at the end of the day, if I compile this file, I will get a zip file. I will not get an assembly binary file, I will get a zip file. So it's also pretty cool to uh, learn how to abuse assembler compilers to do that kind of stuff because it's pretty, pretty useful. Um, yeah, so I guess this is like the, another tool which you, which you have to, um, have to understand, have to use for hacking. If you have these tools, you can program, you can do some reverse engineering, you can do, um, like analyze protocols. You're on a pretty good way to, to like other things, which to achieve other things in hacking. Um, yes, now let's move to a totally different topic which is interactions with others. So there is this myth that hackers are basically people, you know, sitting in a, uh, in a basement, right? In like black hood who barely go outside and like only chat with people on internet chats. That's not really tr true and do not, do not try to be that person. Um, and uh, the issue here is that it's super important as a hacker to interact with others for three reasons. First is knowledge sharing. If you learn something, and you try to explain it to others, um, you do two things. You first of all, crystallize and structure the knowledge in your head, and that will help you with understanding what you learned. That will help you a lot, and that will help you point out the weak spots which you do not understand because you cannot explain them in simple terms. Uh, the second thing is you're sharing the knowledge. You're doing something for the hacker community, which is always appreciated. You, there is a lot of resources on the internet, I've linked you like a list of blog posts about how to get into hacking. And this is because people are sharing knowledge. Even if you are a beginner, share the knowledge, uh, 
like do not claim to be an expert do not write from an expert perspective but say yeah these are my like notes which are my learning notes and this is what i learned today uh, maybe it will be useful for something these are like my conclusions my key points uh, this might be useful for some someone down the road and you will also structure the knowledge for yourself so that's pretty important to do another thing is um, as a security professional you will be explaining security to other people so um yeah and the last thing you want to do is you want to like piss them off or you want to uh like make them not like you because that will not achieve anything uh in the end the goal is to secure a system not to like and like the easiest way possible otherwise it's a waste of time right so um yeah you have to learn some diplomacy you have to learn some explaining things like why is security important uh why did this bug happen you do not go and yeah your developers are stupid so this, they made this mistake you do not do that right uh, you have to learn how to diplomatically explain that this bug was made it was found in the code it's like pretty normal this is a common bug a lot of people make it this is how you might fix it this is what we what would happen if the bug would actually not be fixed uh, at the end of the day, you need to also respect that it might be a business decision to not fix the bug, right? Because the business owner uh, works in a different environment. They care about uh, like risk analysis. They care about like, okay, so if somebody exploits the bug, right? Uh, what will happen versus uh, how many, like how much money we will, we will lose versus how much time would the developer have to spend to fix it? So uh, this is something which, uh, yeah, we, we, we as security professionals might not agree with, but uh, that will happen from time to time, um, but the decision will be to not fix a given bug. And uh, we also have to learn as security professionals to not overstate the importance of a bug. Like there might be bugs where you have spent two weeks trying to exploit it. At the end of the day, you exploit it. Your exploit is like ingenious. It's pure genius. The bug is super interesting. But at the end of the day, it might be that, yeah, it's cool technically, but it doesn't have severe impact. So learning about impact, learning about risk analysis, it's also pretty important in learning how to communicate it to others. So um, try to learn that as well, how to efficiently communicate with others, how to educate them on security, how to, uh, and not how to, you know, like make enemies because that's not the, that's not the game we're playing. Um, yeah, and then there's also another branch of hacking, which I guess if you read Kevin Mitnick's books, it's, uh, you know about it, it's social engineering. Social engineering is a powerful tool which is used like on both sides of a barricade, I guess, but um, mostly like, you know, phishing, for example, is, uh, is that's a social engineering attack. There is like little technical cool stuff. There is no cool stuff in technically in phishings, right? But phishings are super effective. Furthermore, I know for a fact that phishing is effective against uh, security professionals, like security professionals who expect that, are, that they are going to be phished might still fall victim to a phishing if they like are distracted if they have a bad day so yeah do not blame victims for of phishing like yeah you should have noticed no that's, that's bullshit uh you you can like even fish security professionals so um yeah uh, and this is a social engineering attack basically if there are other social engineering attacks where like if you read kevin mitnick's books like where they like a person goes somewhere and claims to be someone for the benefit right uh and Sometimes if you're a security professional and you're doing penetration testing or physical penetration testing, uh, you might do that as well. And um, it's kind of like uh, not a lot of people are comfortable with that. And honestly, I don't think I would be comfortable with doing social engineering attacks, especially like physical ones. Uh, also, like the, the reason like I have this and I'm, I'm quite easy to remember. So that wouldn't make me would make me a terrible a really terrible uh, social engineer, I think, like a, a physical one. But this is also a skill which is sometimes required when doing penetration tests. So especially like create an email which looks convincing that the person has to do something. And I know a couple of uh, really good penetration test companies who do also offer social uh, social engineering trainings and attacks um, to yeah uh, to their to their clients. And again, this is like something that um, you need the permission of uh, attacked entity to, to do, right? So in this case, that would be a permission of a company, it wouldn't be a permission of employee, but there's also a need to respect the boundaries of the privacy of employee. So we go back to ethics, right? And the law. Uh, there are e like lines you should not cross with social engineering either. 
And uh, also I said that, yeah, you can fish everyone. Uh, like I'm not saying you can fish everyone, but I say that uh, even like the smartest people who are expecting to get fished, uh, if they have like a worse day or they are distracted, they can still get fished. So um, another inter interesting exercise is how to minimize the impact of fishing. Assume the fi that fishing is going to happen, how to minimize the impact of it. And that's also something which people who are responsible for security, especially of the companies, try to do. It's called defense in depth. And you try to, yeah, like if, if we assume that everyone can get fished, how do we create a a system like a security system that still is somewhat secure and the damage isn't that big so this is something uh, also hackers uh, care about and now the last talking point i have are certificates certificates are certificates important in security uh depends and um it basically depends on what you want to do as a security professional as a hacker do who do you want to work for do you want to work for the government do you want to work for banks do you want to work for uh, some government agency, then certificates might be more required than in other areas. When there are areas like, for example, private companies, a lot of private companies do not care about certificates, uh, especially if they if they understand security, they know that uh, certificates and security are not super important. So you have to decide that for yourself. Um, there is absolutely no shame in owning a certificate. Furthermore, if you like certificates, and this is like a way what, what motivates you to learn. And there's a lot of stuff to learn. Uh, then, yeah, like absolutely do them. Why not? Yeah, like make a game out of it. Like how many certificates can I get? Uh, so yeah, there, I would say it depends on what's you, what your final goal is. I do not own any certificates. Neither do does like uh, at least like Paris and El Camto. I, I think El Camto doesn't own any. Uh, yeah, like these are people that would create certification programs, not really make certificate like do certificates i guess so yeah it's up to you there is like yeah no great benefit there is no great loss either so up to you okay and now i'm going to move to questions so if you have any questions you can ask kshaku and kshaku will give me the question and i will try to answer it so let's spend the rest of the stream live stream where i i, I will try to answer the questions which you have uh, what's your opinion on the about the future of binary exploitation, will it fade, fade away sometime? Uh, this is a question which is being asked for at least as long I am I am in security, or at least the last 15 years. Uh, because, you know, binary exploitation is an area which has a lot of mitigations, like uh, there's buffer overflow, but there's a mitigation about uh, for buffer overflow, and there are two mitigations for the ways how to exploit it, and two mitigations to further mitigate the ways to bypass the other mitigations, and so on. There's quite a lot of research in binary exploitation done, and uh, currently it does not seem to be going away, for two reasons. First of all, it um, if you do not write secure code, mitigations will help only in some cases, but almost never in all cases. They will make things harder, but they will not make things impossible. For example, instead of one vulnerability due to the mitigation which is applied, you have to use five, five vulnerabilities and chain them together. But yeah, still five, five vulnerabilities can be found. People have proven that over and over again. And um, that's one thing. And then there's a lot of code base which is created, compiled either in the past without any mitigations and this is just like fair game to exploit it, basically, uh, as in, you know, technically speaking. And uh, there's still code created, especially for IoT devices, embedded devices, where little mitigations are being applied, and it's it's way easier to exploit stuff there. Uh, cell phones do not count. Cell phones have a lot of mitigations for other reasons. So um, will it fade, fade away? I don't think so. Uh, at least not yet. Maybe... Yeah, I, I I'm not do not like making long-term predictions, but ask me that question in 15 years and we'll see. But currently, I don't think it's fading away yet. Maybe if we get different CPUs with uh, and everyone starts writing code in languages which are safe, like memory safe, do not have low-level um, bugs, do not have low-level code, then yeah, but there will still be a lot of code which is legacy. So yeah, but currently... Yeah. Uh, that being said, on that topic, binary exploitation 
uh, there is a lot of interest in, for binary exploitation, but please note that there aren't too many career opportunities for binary exploitation. Uh, most of the internet as we know it is web. So there's a lot of, there are usually a lot of positions for web, there are a lot of positions for other things like intrusion detection. Um, for binary, binary exploitation and vulnerability research, you have to be really, really good to find a job there. So keep that in mind. And um, yeah, usually it's good to specialize in a couple of things, not, on, not only one thing. Uh, I think I should actually show you the, mm, the questions here. So let's go with uh, the next one. Sorry if this has been asked before, but I haven't yet watched all of your streams. Can you guide us through your personal setup, like uh, OS, most often use tools, workflow, maybe even how you set up your stream or some hardware stuff, basically uh, how you work on a daily basis. This is, um, so I'm not going to fully answer this question. There was a live stream uh, around, I think, 45, number 45, like episode 45, where I showed my live streaming setup. Then um, my, as for my setup, so okay, the important thing here is that there is a myth that all hackers use Linux, and that's, yeah, that's not true. I do not use Linux, for example, as a main desktop, I use Windows, and I know a couple of other great researchers who also do the same, or I know uh, multiple people who use Macs for, for the same purpose. So that's just not true. Use what is the best operating system for you like what you feel more most comfortable with. Uh, because at the end of the day, you will be spending a lot of time in front of your computer and you do not want the computer to fight against you because you do not know how to, use, like someone told you, oh, switch to Linux because hackers use Linux. And then you are like figure, trying to figure out how to copy a file. So uh, that's just wasting time. On the other hand, Linux is a dominant server system. You kind of have to learn Linux one way or the other in most, if not all, of security areas. So, um, yeah, like putting Linux on your desktop is one of the ways to do it. Also, like if you put it on your desktop, maybe maybe it is the best operating system for you. So that's well, one way. But there's no one way to go. It's like, do what's the best for you. For for me, my setup is basically uh, Windows. I have I need a lot of screen space. I really like screen space. I feel better if I can have a lot of windows open. So I have four monitors, and uh, like in a, in a basically in a cross setting. Um, yeah, and I also have a virtual machine with Linux running all the time because I do a lot of Linux stuff at the end of the day. I do not use it on my as my main desktop, but I use a lot of Linux anyway. And then I have multiple computers around with which have Linux. There's one standing, actually there are three standing there. There are three others standing there. Uh, some of them are like as small as Raspberry Pi, other are like full-blown servers. So um, yeah, uh, as for most used tools, it depends. Uh, I guess Sublime, like a text, a, a simple text editor is the most commonly used tool for me, as is the console with Python interpreter. Because even if I need to do some math or a simple script, I usually go to Python interpreter. Um, Total Commander is a tool which I cannot live without. And then there are stuff like hex editors. Uh, I use hex workshop, but it doesn't matter. It can be any hex editor. I'm, I'm looking at the list of the tools I have in my like uh, shortcuts for. Um, then I have IDA, obviously, for reverse engineering. I have uh, ODDBG and X60, uh, X64DBG as debuggers. I also have uh, WinDebugger, Win, WinDBG. Um, I have... What else do I have? Then I have... Uh, Browsers. Browsers are like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to say the obvious thing, but browsers are super important for web security for obvious reasons. And browsers, especially like Chrome or Firefox, have really good dev development tools which can be used for security as well. And I think that's about it, actually. If you're like wondering if I'm using like Kali Linux or uh, Backtrack or if I'm using, um, what was it called? Like, you know, uh, Metas uh, Metasploit or other hacking tools, I do not use a lot of them. I I think I've run Metasploit twice. So it's not just, just not the things which I use. Mm, yeah. And yeah, obviously I guess like GCC for compilation. But that's about it, I would say. Okay, next question. Um, yeah, this is the one which I'm scrolling. Uh, RMP says, 
when you have to work with a technology that is not really well known to you, what is, in your opinion, the best approach? Like, do you study that specific technology from the ground up? You start searching on other people's research on the same technology and expand from there. How do you personally approach the situation when dealing with a technology which is not my uh, my fourth and my main area of expertise? Um, yes, that's the answer. Yes, uh, I do everything which uh, uh, which I can. Usually, I start with watching one or two YouTube videos about it. They can be like 10 minutes, they can be up to 40 minutes. I usually like just set put my headphones on, set the speed to two times X and, and just like skim through it. Um, I don't have to remember everything. I just have to get the, like the general idea. What is this technology trying to achieve? What is the main concept behind it? Um, after that, I try to be as hands on as possible. And also if it's like a framework, I need to download the source code if possible. Uh, but like the source code is super useful. It's the best documentation at the end of the day. Then the official documentation, that's super helpful. And then just everything I can find on Google while doing things. So I do not preemptively look like for things I might need, but I try to do things and then like this comes up, I need to do this. I have no idea how to do it. Was the canonical way to do it in this framework? And I do do that. And uh, this is like, uh, it sounds like learning programming, but in security is the same, right? Because you have to first understand something and trying to work with a given framework gives you an understanding of it. Then, then you might start looking for bugs in it. Uh, same for applications, same for libraries. So that would be my approach. Um, now, it also depends on what exactly is available. Uh, the, I don't really like to start with reading the documentation of something without looking at it first and getting my own measure of, of what I'm dealing with. Because reading the documentation, there's a lot of great information there. But it doesn't, like, I do not know what to connect that information with. What is the problem which is trying to be solved? So yeah, like, hands-on first, then I try to read more about it, more about the research which has been done, and uh, go from there. So I would say I do it like that. Again, no single answer. You choose what is the best for you. Learning how to learn is the first step. It's a step, or rather, it's not the first step. It's a step which you will be making improving on and making better and better for yourself through the years and like every time you find a new trick you will just adjust it like make it your own if you think that's worthwhile so, and that's normal so that's that's good okay any advice um to get a better understanding of the linux inner workings for windows i read through windows internals and various presentations uh, there is too much source code to for an overview uh, so I guess this is a direct question for any resources, and I honestly do not know. I would go to LVM website. There are a lot of uh, a lot of good articles there about the inner workings of Linux. But apart from that, I don't think I would try to understand. Like at the end of the day, I would try to split the problem. So okay, I want to learn about how Linux works internally, but. Um, like that's just a high level thing which you want to do. What does it, what does this problem split into? What parts do it, does it split into? Oh, I want to understand how the file system works, how the networking stack works and how the memory manager works. So, okay, when I go to memory manager, how, um, let's say I want to understand first how the memory manager works and um, I can look for research resources for that. And um, I can also start digging into the code in the kernel for a given problem for like the code for networking manager is going to be large, but it's still like only a piece of, the, of everything. I learned that, I experiment with it, that's important thing. I always do manual work, I like to get the manual skills, right? And, uh, and after that, yeah, maybe now I try to explore the file system. Oh, there are like 10 implementations of file system and there are syscalls which bind it all together and make a user interface. So maybe I start, uh, should start learning about the syscalls. How do the syscalls work? And then how do the syscalls for the file system work? And then how, like, for example, AX, uh, a AXT4 is implemented or like uh, some, other, uh, some other file system. Oh, it's implemented like this. Maybe I should experiment creating a file system image from scratch using like Python or whatever. And, um, or maybe I should just create a, a file system and look at it from a hex editor, try to write a parser for it. That's basically how, how I would approach it as in I would try to figure out what exactly do I need to learn. And then I would, yeah, I said three things at the beginning, right? When a uh, memory manager, I said the, um, 
network stack and I still have a file system. But when you start looking into these, you will see they are interconnected with other things, which I did not enumerate, and you just note them down and go there when needed, uh, or when the time comes to learn that part of a system. So that's how I would do it without even having one awesome resource like the Windows Internals book is, which is an amazing resource. There's another book for like that for uh, Mac OS X, there's like OS X Internals. And, um, but yeah, at the end of the day, you do not need such a resource if you just split the problem into smaller pieces and try to approach that. Okay, next question. Uh, what is your opinion about the new Windows Terminal? Are you going to switch? The new Windows Terminal is pretty cool, but we try to use it even on, on the live stream, right? But it kinda, it's kind of still buggy, so yeah. But it is pretty cool. I really like this, like that you can turn on this feature so it looks like on a CRT, old CRT monitor and like the translucence background. Uh, I guess this isn't really an on-topic question, but yeah, I like it. I'm probably going to switch but uh, it's still a little bit buggy. Uh, Zero uh, writes uh, with absolute pwnage. I have seen so many Instagram hackers who really are script kiddies and they sell these advanced courses on a Nmap and uh, Netcat. Uh, this is just coming, what do you think? Okay, uh, I have, uh, so it's like this. Uh, first, if you do not know what a script kiddie is, a script kiddie is like a not really, not really a nice term for people who are um, trying to be hackers without understanding what they are doing. So I focus today on like get into the details of what you are doing. This is the most important thing because even if there is no tool for that, you can create a tool for that. Now, um, a script kit is for like ages, as long as I'm learning hacking is basically uh, a term which is given to people who focus, focus only on tools. They don't try to understand what the tool does, they focus on tools and and uh, give a lot of, like, yeah. Um, so um, I do not really know about course courses which these courses which these people create. Uh, okay, so at the end of the day, my take on it is like this: um, it's hard to get stupider after re learning from a course. There are some really not good materials, but at the end of the day, if you think what you're reading and verify, then you will not get stupid even stupider even if uh, the course itself doesn't make any sense. Furthermore, um, going back to sharing your knowledge, so they try to share their knowledge, this is I guess a good thing, if they're charging money for it, it's a fair game, right? Uh, I'm not going to comment on that. On that. Um, but the thing is that um, when you're sharing knowledge, part of sharing knowledge is answering questions of others, like people who are, um, you know, also trying to do what you are doing, they're on your level, uh, they are just beginners, they are like above your level, but, but has some question about your area of expertise. And uh, when getting such questions, sometimes the questions are really, really, you can think of them as um, dumb. Uh, like, yeah, you are like totally, you see the questions and you're like, yeah, that's absolutely not the way it works. You're asking the wrong question. Now, in hacking, what is actually an excellent thing is think about the question a little longer. Maybe it doesn't work like that, but maybe there's an idea there. Like, uh, what was the person thinking? Uh, maybe the, the dumb question actually uncovers an area where, where you can learn something new where you can find some vulnerabilities. Even if the question doesn't make sense, maybe it can actually point you to a direction which you didn't think before, because you wouldn't, because it's just stupid to, to, to do that. But now, because you got that question and you're forced to think in that direction, maybe you see, oh, like, yeah, you shouldn't do it like that. But if you do it like that, what would actually happen? Maybe somebody actually made a mistake there, maybe I can find a vulnerability there. And that, uh, that happens sometimes. Uh, worst case scenario, you, you will learn like that, yeah, it was just like a red herring, nothing interesting there, but an interesting thought ex exercise. So yeah, I um, that's basically the comment I can, I can give on it. But uh, yeah, do not, mm, as I mentioned, tools shouldn't be the main thing of your focus. Focus on understanding how it works. This is what hacking boils down to, to have a deep understanding, deep knowledge of how things works, not not how to use the tool. Uh, 
having the understanding and knowing how to use the tool, that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. Like, why not? And Nmap is an amazing tool, and Netcat is a tool which you will use a lot, so uh, that's another thing. Jackpot writes, what if I have a license of a software and try to reverse engineer, uh, reverse engineer it without benefit for just for testing of skills? Mm, it uh, Okay, this is a question for a lawyer, basically. My answer is, and I am not a lawyer, uh, this is how I approach the subject is. If I'm, I need to reverse engineer the software to check for backdoors, to check for vulnerabilities, this is for game, regardless of what the user agreement says. They uh, cannot prevent you from testing if they didn't backdoor the software. Um, and if they can, yeah, like prepare for a legal battle, but like this is where you should make a stand. Um, yeah, I think there are actually some... Again, it depends on the country. One country might say, yeah, like this is absolutely prohibited. Another country might be like, yeah, like you have a blanket approval for testing for vulnerabilities or for testing for some other stuff. And a lot of countries actually have that kind of blanket approval for parts of reverse engineering. Uh, for example, in Poland, that would be, and again, check with your lawyer, but if I remember correctly, it was something that if you want to change ways the program works to make it... Uh, compatible with other parts of a system, then you are absolutely fair to use reverse engineering for that. Now, another thing is piracy. And um, if you reverse engineer something for like, because you want to remove the anti, uh, anti like DRM, like digital right management or anti-piracy um, parts like of a code, that is not legal in most of the countries, not all of them, but in most of the countries and you can get in trouble for that. So do Take care, right? Take care uh, about uh, like for yourself and don't um, don't get into trouble because why? Why should you? There are other ways to practice reverse engineering. Another avenue is like cheats for games, which also require reverse engineering. My take on it, personal take, is single player games. Yeah, sure, just go for it. Uh, multiplayer games, uh, I don't do it. That's not really ethical. And especially using cheats, it's not ethical. Like uh, making cheats is one thing, but there are like more lawsuits coming from angry game developers where they claim that cheat makers are spoiling their business because players are annoyed and they're not buying like skins and so on. So yeah, be careful when making multiplayer cheats because you might get hit by a loss, like a preemptive lawsuit saying that yeah, they wanted to make that and then they wanted to share it. And uh, yeah, so be careful with that. I It's cool technically. I understand it's cool technically. At the end of the day, maybe just... Uh, um, maybe just make a game or get a game like an open source game where uh, where you can practice on without hurting anyone, any other players, any developers. Uh, because um, at the end of the day, it's also important for there to be people who understand how to make that because anti-cheats also need to be made and people who are making anti-cheats need to know how to, how to make that. And that's also part of hacking, right? So yeah, um, technically interesting, but uh, yeah, there you go. And uh, and yeah, and licenses are an interesting thing. Chat with your lawyer, but basically, um, not everything written in license is okay with the law. And sometimes there are like parts which you can just throw away because they're not legal in your country. And um, yeah, but yeah, and they might be legal in another country, so take care. Uh, yeah, and then there are some things which the law allows and the license just cannot forbid you to do. No the law, chat with lawyers, as I mentioned. Uh, Dashin writes, uh, do you consider social engineering hacking? Uh, it's not technical hacking, for sure. It's not typical technical hacking, uh, but it is used in computer security, and I usually put hacking and, like, and hacking equals computer security. So I would also, I guess, put social engineering somewhere there. It might not be hacking, but it's, it's somewhat related in practice. It's just, you know, like classification. Classification doesn't really matter. But uh, I care more about technical hacking, as you know. But again, there are fantastic teams, fantastic companies, which uh, do uh, social engineering tests as well as part of pen penetration tests. Uh, Camille writes, do I need a PhD uh, to be an offensive vulnerability researcher? No, absolutely no. Now, this is something, I don't believe there are like PhDs in it. Well, maybe PhDs, yes, but don't not really like master degrees or... Okay. 
Uh, there are master degrees physicists in that, but I do not believe there are any university courses that fully focus on being an offensive security researcher. This is something you have to teach yourself. And um, you might get to the level and quite quickly where like a PhD level, but you do not have to do a formal PhD in it. Uh, but yeah, like, I, like, in all honesty, just go and read some of the research which Tavis Ormandidas or Mateusz Jurczyk uh, do. These, this, like, is above PhD level easily. Uh, Faith writes, um, uh, sorry, Fatih, um, uh, will you do a live stream about vulnerability research zero day hunting? Uh, I'm going to go back to my blog because I have another FAQ blog post about that. So, um, I, where was it? Right. Oh yeah, how do I find vulnerabilities? Uh, you can look at this blog post. Maybe, maybe you will find something interesting there. Um, okay, now. I'm doing live streams about, I, I already did some live streams about vulnerability research, even doing that on CTF tasks. Sorry, even doing that on CTF tasks is somewhat, it is like actually super similar to actual applications, but you're not time limited and the application is larger. That's the main difference, but uh, yeah, like CTF some, have some super hard vulnerability research problems sometimes. Um, but I'm not sure, well, I know I will not do that for any real application on live stream because I actually might find something. And I do not like disclosing zero days without merit. I prefer to give the, uh, the vendor chance to actually respond and like make a fix before I start saying that, yeah, we have, we have this vulnerability. Uh, like responsible disclosure, vendor coordinated disclosure and full disclosure are things which you might actually want to um, to also read about if you are a vulnerability researcher. Uh, so yeah, do check that. And another thing to note here, I guess, is um, uh, which is like totally not related to, the, to, uh, to this question is which I, which I forgot to mention, but it is thankfully in the blog posts of other people. So you, you would find it as well is try to see what the community is doing. Like for example, on Twitter, the InfoSec community is really, uh, really, really active. On the other hand, on NetSec, there is like, uh, if you go to Reddit, uh, reddit.com slash r slash NetSec, it's another popular um, InfoSec uh, news discussions and so on. And there's also Hacker News where, which has a lot of interesting things and community. So th these are the things that you might want to follow just to like get a glimpse of what the community is doing. Uh, yeah. Okay, another question. How did you learn algorithms? Why or maybe does not algorithms matter? In security, algorithms per se do not matter that much. They matter sometimes, but rarely. And um, they matter more in like some parts of programming, not even only in programming, but some parts of programming. And uh, how did I learn them? I learned them mostly on my university on um, during the first year and the second year, there was a lot of algorithms and, and yeah, and that's where I learned them. I do not consider myself to be good with algorithms. I know a lot of people are way better. Uh, but I can stand my ground, basically. I, if I need to implement some weird algorithm or like figure out what crop, what proper algorithm to use and how to tweak it, I will probably be able to do it, or I will just find a person who knows how to do it and ask them, or hire them to do it because that might be more time efficient. Um, now, where is uh, where are there are like you need to know as a programmer the basic algorithms and basic data structures. I'm sorry, there is no getting away from that, and that will be useful in security as well. Otherwise, your brute forces, your exploits will be super super slow, and your tools will be lacking in quality and will be super super slow again. So learn the basics. It's uh, it's actually fun. Um, so especially like basic data structures and basic algorithms, basic graph algorithms. What's bisection? Bisection is useful when doing uh, SQL injection, blind SQL injection. So there are some algorithms which you will use. Also, cryptography is partly algorithms. So uh, yeah, if you know like some algorithmics, 
you will be able to read how cryptography works a little easier. Um, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's not it's not key in hacking. It's important, but it's not key. Rarely, but sometimes there are attacks which rely solely in on problems in chosen algorithms. For example, there was a hashing problem with hash tables in almost all implementation and all languages, which uh, allowed a remote attacker to do a denial, a simple denial of service on the on applications. And uh, this has been uh, taken care of, but it was a big deal at the time because yeah, like sending one megabyte of data, it could easily crash a server, uh, like just fill the memory or like, well, not really fill the memory, fill the CPU time of the server. So yeah, it's uh, good to know. It's not crucial, but it's good to know. And that's my right. Hacking the art of exploitation uh, by John Erickson. Just started reading it, but I can definitely recommend that. It is one of the classic books in... Um, oh, sorry, I don't know. You do not see the question. Let me uh, show it to you. It is one of the classic books, I guess, in hacking. Yeah, like as I said, there is no single book, but there are a lot of good books which you can look at. Also, The Art of Security Software Assessment is another book I would recommend. Silence on the Wire, totally I would recommend that one. Hacker's Delight, I would recommend for different reasons. Uh, there are a lot of good books. So, yeah. In all honesty, I try to buy a lot of books because, yeah, they, they're quite quite inspiring for me. So, yeah, you can, you can see quite a lot of books there anyway. Uh, Vertex writes, How were you learning about operating systems? There are many resources about networks and web dev, but I cannot find any good resource uh for learning about us internal so first learn the learn an operating system from an administrator's point of view and there are a lot of books how to admin how to be an administrator administrator a sysadmin and sysop whatever you want to call it nowadays a devops whatever <laughs> um how to be a sysadmin for like linux how to be a sysadmin for windows if you are using windows and then you start learning how to be a sysadmin for windows you will like make eyes like this there are so many hidden tools on windows that's just unbelievable so uh yeah it's like totally different world you start looking at the at windows totally different when uh, you look as a user on for linux is it's uh that jump isn't such like there isn't uh, this huge gap i would say between users and sysadmins but on, on windows that's ab absolutely true now uh how to do it well there are a lot of there are a lot of books on that and that will surprise tell you surprisingly a lot about the internals as well these aren't strict inter internals but yeah and then um windows internals osx internals these two books and similar books for android for example they have a lot of useful information but um you can do it the other way around learn to program to create like simple applications that use the system's features like for example uh for windows write an application which displays a window without using qt or without using any other window library do it using win api uh, try some advanced reverse engineering there and this will allow you to learn a little bit how the windows api works and from that how the system actually works how is it structured um, and then there are a lot of tools which allow you to exp ex um, explore the operating system for example for windows uh, these would be um, Nearsoft. Nearsoft isn't a company, but it's one person who makes a lot of absolutely amazing tools. So, yeah, and they allow you to ex explore different parts of uh, of operating system. Absolutely donate to this person. He's amazing. Uh, that's one thing. Then there's Sys Internals. Sys Internals is a company which was acquired by Windows, is it by Windows, by Microsoft, and they make a lot of utilities for exploring operating system like Process Explorer, Proto Process Monitor, VM Map, and tens of others. Uh, check this out. Also, there are a lot of uh, there are some books and like some blog posts which are linked here. Check this out as well. These give you a nice insight into what is in the operating system. But at the end of the day, is like uh, for Linux, it's reading the source code of a kernel, it's interacting with the kernel, it's uh, interacting with the uh, devices like modules or drivers, however you want to call them. Uh, for Windows, 
Yeah, Windows internal bo Internals book is your go-to. This is an excellent book, uh, quite unique, so there you have it. And I guess I, I've i went through this in, back in my time, but also, also now I've kind of started relearning how the modern Linux works with systemd and so on. So, yeah. Another way is you can look at uh, something which is called the bootkit. How do bootkit works? Uh, how the, because learning that allows you to learn how does an operating system boot? What happens when you turn on the computer and then suddenly boot sector is run and um, what is happening then? How does the operating system start? This is an excellent question. There are some write-ups about it. There are some um, like maybe books about it. But at the end of the day, using reverse engineering techniques, you can get to the bottom of that yourself and kind of understand how how is the system booting which parts in what order and what's being loaded first that's also super uh like gives you a lot of overview of, of the operating system aman writes uh, what do you do when you are really stuck on a certain stuff i lose enthusiasm after stacking for a long time uh, can you help uh, yeah, this is a good question, and um, I'm kind of lucky in the sense that I'm a really patient person, and um, but that doesn't mean I do not lose motivation after a couple of weeks anyway. Uh, I try to, I always personally try to figure out something myself, because every time I ask a question to somebody else, I uh, basically get rid of a learning opportunity, and I do not like doing that. And that is a bad thing, like this habit is a bad thing if you are working for a company and you just join the company, ask the questions, like because you need to get quickly up to speed to start working. But if you're if you're researching something, then uh, if you are researching something, then you're probably there's nobody to ask because you're like pushing the boundary anyway. Right. But if you are learning and researching, then try to mm, try to do something by yourself. It might be painful, uh, but um, yeah. Okay, now for some actual techniques. Um, I usually try to look for examples when some uh, when someone tried to do exactly the same thing, and I go through the example maybe to find what what I'm doing wrong. It doesn't have to be exactly the same thing, but something similar. Then like Stack Overflow, the obvious resource. Not ask her. Like look for the questions. Uh, look for questions which are similar to what you're trying to achieve. Uh, br so you browse through the documentation. Um, as well, then um, at the end of the day, what I try to do is a trick I learned some. I, I think my maybe my wife told me about it, but uh, it's basically I try to not stop doing something uh, until I find the solution. So I focus on it as long as needed, even like sometimes going to sleep late uh, to solve it so that the next day I know I do not have this large problem looming over me because I solved it and I can do the next step. Um, sometimes it's not as easy, there are problems which take several days to solve and you just have to like, I guess, settle in and try to solve them at the end. Now, when I was like more junior, let's say, right, and I was still learning this stuff, I did another thing which isn't the greatest, but I learned to um, to sometimes just say that, yeah, I cannot currently solve this problem, so I'm just going to put it away in the drawer and focus on a different thing. Mm -hmm. I know multiple people get stuck on a single problem and it stops them from going further. And solving that problem isn't the only solution. Sometimes the solution is to put it away, come back to it in several years or several months or so, so on, like when you get more knowledge. So it's okay. It's okay to do that. It's absolutely okay to say, yeah, like I wanted to create a game, right? And I got stuck after doing these steps because, yeah, I just don't know what the next step is. And then you are like, for, for several weeks, you're like, yeah, like I have, I should, I should do this game. I should code this game, but this problem is very, and it's scaring me. And then, and weeks go by and you never find the motivation to do it. Don't do that. Um, put the game away do something else start learning something new maybe maybe you will never go back to that problem um maybe you will go back in a month and you say or like in a year and you say well this is actually trivial like i should have solved it like this uh so yeah don't get too obsessed over one single problem there will be multiple like thousands of problems which you will get stuck on 
I will try to work through them, power through them. If you cannot do it now, try to just put it away and focus on something else. That's not always possible and sometimes you just have to do something and then you might have to ask for help. If you're working for a company, ask your team lead, ask your senior colleague, ask your uh, like ask the company, ask your manager to hire a consultant to do that. But um, because you have to do something, right? But if you're learning, then do not get obsessed over one problem. If you cannot, after like, uh, I don't know, a day, two days, you are absolutely stuck and you cannot, you, you do not really want to continue doing that, then don't. Like, just go with a different problem and start with, with new things. Uh, maybe go back to a problem you put in a drawer some time ago and try to solve it now. So that's my take on it. Um, now... Uh, during CTFs, there are actually other things which I try. If, because CTFs are time limited and you do have to solve a problem and there is no consultant you can hire, right? So what you what I do is I start to first restart the problem, which means that, yeah, I was doing this and I got to this point and I'm like so close, but I'm so close for one hour and I do, I'm not making any progress. So I just put this away, create a new directory for the challenge, download the challenge again, read the challenge again, and uh, start solving the challenge again. And maybe I will go a different road, a different path, and that will allow me to, to solve the problem. Uh, like it works half of the time, the other half of the time I get stuck in the same exact place. So the other, the other trick is I write what I did. Like I create notes with the intention to pass it to another player on my team. And while writing notes, uh, I, it might might happen, quite often it happens, I will write like, and then I did this because of this, and I'm like, why did I do it like this? Maybe I could do actually also this, this, and that, and maybe that would work, and so I go and check. And only after I like write the whole notes, check everything which came to my mind during writing the notes. Again, writing the notes, sharing knowledge, you structure the data you have in your head, you uh, crystallize the data you have in your head, new ideas come to you, you get, you find the weak points. So after I addressed all these weak points and after the, all the ideas which came to my head during writing that, uh, I, I pass it to another person. If there is no person to pass it to, I try to go for a walk, go to sleep, like, I don't know, sleep 15 minutes, do a power nap. Uh, because, yeah, I will sleep, my brain will still process it, like in the background somewhere, and maybe I will wake up with a solution. Uh, it sounds stupid, but it works. And if it works, it's not stupid, right? So yeah, it's not magic, it's, uh, it's actually desc described in psychology, uh, like, uh, and there's actually a term for it, I have no idea what the term is in English, though. Uh, can I, let me see if I can s quickly check it. Uh, um, it is called in English, insight, okay. So yeah, uh, it's called insight in English, and... And yeah, going for a walk actually makes, sometimes it happens, but you get an insight, which is like, um, yeah, basically is like, uh, uh, um, yeah, this is, these are not the, anyway, one of these definitions is basically that is like a moment where sometimes sudden, something suddenly snaps in your head and you're like, oh, this is the solution. This is an insight. And you don't have to actively process a problem to, to get an insight. That's how our brains work. Okay, uh, so yeah, these are the things I do. Uh, TR per or Trepper writes, so you're obviously someone with a ton of experience in sharing knowledge. Could you give some insight in how different methods like live streaming and even creating a magazine compare to each other? Uh, good question. Uh, but, but I am not a person to ask this because my knowledge in sharing knowledge is self-taught. I've never done any research, and I probably should have, about how to properly do the stuff which I do, how to properly write a book, how to properly create a magazine, how to properly write an article, how to write a blog post. I, I just do it intuitively, and um, which means I'm probably doing a lot of mistakes. I could have improved in a lot of places because there are people actually researching this area and saying, but yeah, this would be a more effective way to teach folks, and this might be like a better way to show something. This might be more understandable if you put it like this, right? And uh, so I'm not the best person probably to, to talk about it. At the end of the day, what I try to do is um, when doing research, I make notes. And I need, and there are like sometimes a lot of notes. Uh, like the harder the thing is for me, it doesn't have to be hard, like, you know, objectively. It, it, the harder the thing is 
for me, I try to make them more notes. So if I'm learning electronics, I make a lot of notes. I have like for a single project, which is like, like uh, I would say it's easy. Um, I still make like 25 pages of notes. Uh, like each step I make, I make some notes, but yeah, I, I'm doing this because of this. And here's a link to a paper where I, which I've read to address this problem and so on and so forth. And I write down like, ideas, which I have, write down your ideas, folks, by the way, create a document and always add ideas there so they don't get lost. This is a, a pretty, pretty good tip I've learned. Um, but how do they, at the end of the day, I can sometimes like transfer these notes into a blog post or an article. Um, on the other hand, for live streams, I'm making live streams because I do not have time to make videos, uh, like full-blown videos with editing and so on. That would take uh, a lot of my time and a live stream does not take a lot of my time. So I just, you know, pop on the camera when I have a, an amazing crew, which helps me like Foxtrot, Krzaku, Mariusz and so on, um, or Masakra, who started, uh, like convinced me to do live streaming. So, um, yeah, so basically live streams do not take much time and that's why I'm doing them. Otherwise, I would probably do videos which are well edited like Live Overflow does. Live Overflow, by the way, take a look at his channel and other um, YouTubers as well, security YouTubers. There are a lot of really good security YouTubers nowadays. They do amazing stuff, really good quality videos. So check them out. Uh, they also like carry a lot of, uh, share a lot of knowledge. And at the end of the day, it's also like for, for you, the viewers, basically. Um, people who are here, I guess you, you, you like live streams because otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? And uh, I personally do not like live streams. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a funny thing to say as a, someone who is doing live streams. Um, I guess I would pr prefer just articles. But yeah, I know that uh, I have time to do a live stream. I do not have a time. I do not have time to do an article right now. It would take way more time. So yeah, there, you, there we have it. Uh, and I know there are people who live, li like live streams and like other stuff, and that's fine. Like everyone is, you know, unique in their own way, and everyone has their own methods to quickly get knowledge and acquire and like learn from it. From for some people, it might be videos. For other people, it might be books. For other people, it might be podcasts that they can listen while walking. And other people might like live streams and so on and so forth. Uh, yeah, the more resources you can use, the better. Mm, yeah, but uh, as some like a meaningful comparison because uh, between these things, it's really hard. Live streams are cool because I can show you things and I can interact with you. I really like that aspect of it. I learned a lot from you folks watching the live streams, uh, from the comments on the chat, from the questions which you ask, which forced me to also check something and or like follow up after the live stream so um yeah so that's like one aspect of live streams which is amazing and but does not happen with articles you rarely get any feedback from articles like uh, i've published a lot of them and uh, i don't know i maybe got like two emails in total about them more on blog posts where you have like you comment this comment bar and you can like just type there um so yeah uh, blog posts are more interactive i would say but live streams are super interactive and that's quite amazing uh, also, I actually like text chats, you know, we have a Discord, so you're free to join. I, we have an IRC, so you're also free to join there. And um, I'm happy to always discuss any ideas there. And that's also a good avenue to, to share knowledge. Actually, before doing live streams, like around, I don't know, what was it, 2006, we were doing um, text uh, lectures on IRC. Like some, there was one person who was the lecturer and they were like writing text and showing images and so on uh, for the given subject. And that was quite popular, but some like awesomely popular actually. We stopped doing that when the internet was kind of moving to uh, videos and yeah, and now we have live streams. So I guess I'm just continuing what I did back then, but in a different form. KP writes, how do you recommend getting involved in the hacker community and getting to know security professionals? Just reach out to them. Like, these are people, right? Um, not everyone will reply. Some people are like super busy, like, or really stuck in the research or just like more introverts. Some people are like, they can chat with you. Just, I guess, like, join discords. There are a lot of discords for hacking channels. There's like a discord for HTB for like how to hack the box. Uh, John Hammond has his own discord. Life Overflow has his own subreddit. Uh, yeah, just like join any community, have a chat. Like we are all people, right? So like nobody will bite your head off for saying, hello, I'm new, I'm learning, like let's chat. 
Mm, yeah, another way is, I guess, to go to security conferences and security meetups. There's quite a lot of that going on. Not now, for obvious reasons. But after all, the situation will be a little more normal. There will be, again, security conferences, security meetups. Just go, look at the presentations, chat with people sitting next to you. It's, it's fine. And yeah, in honesty, I go currently go to conferences only to do networking. I rarely watch any lectures. I mostly just chat with people who are there. When are you going to watch Mr. Robot? I have this on my to watch list. I did not get there yet, but I will. Like so many people recommended it. I, I will find some day, some time to watch it. Camille writes, is there some place where I can find security related papers published by companies and academics? Uh, actually, no, and actually, yes. Uh, if you go to the most obvious page, which I guess most of you might have heard of, but maybe not everyone, scholar.google.com. Um, and this is a search engine for um, academic papers. So if I write like fuzzing, for example, it will show me scientific publications for fuzzing. But if I look like XSS, for example, like cross-site scripting, there will be scientific publications by companies, by individual, by academics uh, about XSS. Uh, this is surprisingly, it's pretty good, um, actually. And there is like, if you want your thing, your paper included here, you can do it um, on your own, I guess. Uh, like if we go to vexilium.org and uh, slash pub, and uh, if we look, or maybe not here, but at one of these papers. These are like papers that either I published or Euro published. There are like these meta headers for which are indexed by these search engines, basically. So yeah, you have to have like, like, and there are like multiple types of these meta headers, multiple systems, but if you include them and at the end of the day include the abstract and at the bottom is include the download link, the search engine will also index it and put, put it in this search engine. And uh, yeah, I guess like you can also look for like specific offers, like if you look for offer Gunveil, there are a couple of my publications or publications I usually did with uh, with Euro, right? And you can also look at profiles, like was my Hirsch index and so on. My Hirsch index is one which is like in a scientific community, I'm absolutely like a noob. Uh, but yeah, like um, I guess security it works in its own like plane, I would say. But that's one uh, one part. And the other is, there were like SecDocs, a really nice website, but mm, or like security docs, but I think it's offline now. There are a lot of papers about reverse engineering on Toot for you. Yeah, this website, it um, downloads. And then there are uh, tutorials, papers, dissertations, and so on. This is another, for reverse engineering, there are a lot of things here. I'm not sure how recent they are because this website is ancient, but I think it's still alive, so take a look. Uh, I gave you links on chats. Um, yeah, and apart from that, yeah, like security docs, there was a website back in the days which had a lot of security docs, but I, I think it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I would say follow people on Twitter, follow like blogs of famous researchers and companies, like of any researchers, they don't have to be famous, like good researchers. And uh, like, for example, Project Zero has a really nice blog with a lot of amazing posts and articles and so on, like easily scientific paper quality posts. So uh, follow these. And uh, on Twitter, as I said, like the InfoSec community is pretty active. So you can probably find tweets about cool papers as well. That's how I get my info from like RSS and from Twitter mostly. And also from you folks. So yeah, uh, usually when a good paper com comes out, there are like several people messaging me. Oh, and I guess like another thing was, uh, which like, uh, there is this thing like Ciekawe Papierki. Uh, it's in Polish, it's interesting papers. It's a group which, which isn't really a group. Um, it's a email group where I send links from my RSS. So I daily, almost every day, look at my RSS 
And if there's anything interesting, like a new paper or an inter interesting blog post, I send it to this group. So it's basically my group for where I, uh, oh, sorry about that, uh, where I send the, um, yeah, like this stuff. And you can like subscribe RSS to it, or you can just join this group to, to get informed via email, using email, um, about everything which I put there. Yeah, there's just like stuff I look at. I decided for some reason to make a... Because I usually email myself the links, so I decided to just email the public group about it. Uh, which conferences would you recommend? Uh, good question. So there, it's like this. There are local conferences, local small conferences, which are usually quite cheap. And uh, there are a lot of enthusiasts, like local enthusiasts. They are, they are great for local networking. Um, then there are like... Um, national conferences which like um well, they, there are a lot of good researchers from a given country plus some invited researchers there and these are specific to a given country right and then there are conferences which are um like international which are well known where a lot of top level research is published and that would be black hat that would be uh ccc like chaos communication congress and uh Defcon and Recon. So uh, I can easily recommend these four. And apart from that, like every like one thing to check for the conference is check what kind of conference is it. Is it uh, an academic conference? If you like, if you're in the academic world, the ac academic conferences are a little bit different than the usual hacking conferences. When they're like the community hacking conferences or like industry hacking conferences, um, if they are. If they have presentations which are technical, they are cool. But there are some conferences which are about security, but they're more like uh, people with ties trying to sell you their product. Avoid these con conferences. They're like, uh, unless you're trying to, yeah, I don't know. Like, I wouldn't go to such a conference, honestly. Because there are people trying to sell you products. And if I want to buy a product, I will just Google for it. I'm not going to go for a conference about that. Um, I would prefer to go to a technical conference against that's me. Like if you're a business owner, you might look at it differently, right? So, and that's fair. And yeah, and then there are like uh, small community conferences, like student organized, university organized conferences. They're a little bit different, and um, but they're pretty cool as well. So yeah, but try different conferences. Usually the same people will go to the conferences. And again, conferences are not about talks. They're about networking and talks. So there you have it. Um, Dashin writes, at what point of learning you should start specialized on a specific topic? Uh, when you feel the time has come. Uh, okay, this is kind of philosophical, but uh, you will, there will be things which you will be more drawn to. And that means you want to do them more. And this is where you start to specialize. It. I don't think there's a point in time is like something that will happen and without you knowing it. But yeah, you will just wake up, but oh, I actually like really liked it, so I started spending more time on it, and this is you just naturally, organically specialized in something, and that's a good thing to do. That's the best way to do it. If you have to force yourself, um, yeah, that will work as well, but it's harder then. It's a little bit harder. You need more motivations. It's great to find something which just motivates you to do it. Like you want to do it. You want to get out of bed and do it. Do that thing, not the other thing. That thing. And that's how you naturally specialize in something. Uh, when to start doing it? Well, basically, if you ask that question, that means you probably should do it. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah. Right. Um, but there is no good answer to that question. I think it's a, it's a pretty high-level question. Uh, I forgot to show you that question, by the way. So sorry about that. Uh, Boogie Lit writes, um, or Bog, uh, Boggy? I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your nickname. My apologies. Um, hi, so I am a, a computer science student and I am super interested in malware and malware analysis. I thought myself, I taught myself Assembler, Java and Python. Where should I go next? And uh, I do some basics, reverse engineering CTFs. That's cool. Continue. You're on the right track. Uh, try to do... So usually in reverse engineering, what you, what you want to do is you want to get to know as many op uh, as many obfuscation and protection mechanisms like code protection mechanisms there are because malware uses that so try to figure out how people do it and try to figure learn yourself how to bypass them quickly how to write scripts to bypass them 
um, then also try to write protections like that yourself, like make a packer, make a protector uh, for an executable file. And then also if you're into malware, reverse engineer, start reverse engineering malware, like real malware samples, do it carefully, learn how to do it without infecting your computer, but yes, start doing that, absolutely. And I think you're on your, you, from what you're writing, you're on a good track, continue doing that. Uh, also, see what other people are doing, uh, what other security or other malware analysts are doing, what they are publishing, um, and try also try to get to the current state of art in reverse engineering. But that's your goal uh, for now, and then start to push it further. That would be my answer, I guess. Any good book recommendations in uh, Vanet security? Probably no. I have no idea what Vanet security is. Vanet, vehicular ad hoc networks. Oh, nice. Uh, no, I have no idea about it, so I cannot recommend anything. This is an excellent question, but it's absolutely out of my specialization, so I have no idea about it. Good question, though. Uh, Mr. Foriam writes, um, do you ever try firmware hardware hacking? Do companies ever even do that? Yes and yes. Uh, it is super interesting. There might be a live stream about it soon, but more information about that later. And uh, now, um, do companies do that? Yes, uh, companies do that. There are some... Yeah, I know researchers working for companies who are doing that. I also have been doing that as part of my work a little. Not a, not a lot, but a little. So, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. And this is an area which I'm currently trying to learn. Like, yeah. Uh, new stuff for me, but it's super interesting as well. How important is it to know the math behind crypto for security research? Um, not really. Unless you're going to go for hardcore um, crypto analysis, then you need to know some higher level math for some aspects of, um, for, uh, of applied cryptography, but that's less math than you would expect, actually. There are some, I would say, exceptions. For example, there are some crypto analysis or applied crypto tasks on CTFs related to RSA, which require more math, but it's not super complicated math either. But yeah, unless you're doing like really hardcore algorithmical or crypto analysis stuff, you, you're fine with like solid math basics. You do not need to be a math mathematician. That's my take on it. Your mileage may vary. Um, any vlogs coming soon? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, I guess you saw from Live Overflow his his vlogs about be, it being weird and embarrassing to talk to a camera without audience, uh, like in a vlog style. I tried doing vlogs, but I also get the feeling I need to get through that. But currently, I just don't have too much time to do that. But maybe someday. What do you think about Rust? Do you consider it as a viable replacement for C++? It's claimed to be more memory safe. It is more memory safe due to how it works, how it's structured, but you, it, it's more a pain to write in as well. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a nice language. I didn't write in it too much, but it solves some problems. It's still a low-level language. It has a lot of libraries for it. There are a lot of people who like it. It seems to be a success, I would say. Will it replace C, C++? No, but it is a, a step in the right direction. So let's see. Do you have any CVEs? Quite a lot, actually. I don't know. I never counted all of them. I'm going to say 100, maybe a little more, but yeah. Um, so it's like this. Uh, do not obsess about CVE. CVE is a number which is assigned to a publicly known vulnerability in a publicly available software. Uh, yeah, it's like common vulnerability enumeration. It's not a badge of honor. It's not a certificate that you are awesome. It's just a number assigned to a vulnerability. Uh, that being said, it sometimes is a requirement if you're supposed to be a security researcher doing offensive security in well-known software. It's just bound that you should have full CVEs. Like, yeah, if you're, I don't know, doing malware analysis, you probably won't have any CVEs because that's not your area and you do not care. So, yeah, CVEs are, are just what they are, numbers assigned to vulnerabilities. Um, any tips on finding your own first CVE, which means, which I translate to... Uh, are there any tips for finding vulnerabilities which are worthwhile, which which could get like a number assigned to them? Uh, 
like look again on my blog post on on the blog post about sorry look on my blog on the blog post about um, this how to find vulnerabilities I think it's written there now um, how does assigning CVEs goes I do not know now because it kind of changed back in the days you basically like either the creator of a software you send them the vulnerability they made a patch and then they send an email to Mitre, which is the like M-I-T-R-E, which is the company behind or like the institution behind assigning these numbers uh, to assign a number for this vulnerability and that would get a number basically. Um, on the other hand, you could also do that as a researcher after the fix was in place, you could send Mitre and, and like a request for please assign a number to this vulnerability. Historically, Numbers were assigned only for severe vulnerabilities in super important software. Currently, they are assigned to any vulnerability in any software which is public, so it's easier to get them. And I think there are actually some companies nowadays which assign these numbers, but I'm not really sure how that works. Uh, at the end of the day, it should be the software creator to request the number for you. Uh, but uh, yeah, if they don't want to do it for some reason, ask them, by the way, ask them if they will do it, uh, then you can do it uh, on your own. Uh, but yeah, you, you first have to find some vulnerabilities, yeah, which this blog post is all about. So, yeah. I think some some of phones which got CVEs are somewhere here. Uh, yeah, and like CVEs is one thing, right? But uh, they're also like each company has their own like number for like this is for Adobe. They have these kind of um, numbers. Microsoft has these kind of numbers. So, um, so yeah, there we go. But again, it's like, um, if you're into security research, vulnerab offensive security research, vulnerab sorry, vulnerability research, bug hunting in popular software, then you can care about CVEs. Otherwise, yeah, like whatever. If you like are a security professional which handles the security of internal systems, you will not get any CVEs because that doesn't matter for you. We sell like you're working on private software uh no cvs are assigned and that's that's okay that's normal like do not obsess over cvs but yeah unless you are again an offensive researcher which tries to get a job uh as an offensive researcher for public so public software and there is there aren't too many jobs like that sadly this is a fun job but there aren't too many jobs like that Paul writes, uh, what are your thoughts on CFI protection mechanisms against code reuse attacks? Uh, CFI being, um, what was the, oh my, control flow integrity and code reuse attacks being like, for example, uh, return oriented programming, uh, jump oriented programming and so on. Um, it partially works. It doesn't fully work. It partially works. It's a really cool concept, but, um, the problem is that you can make really amazing mitigations, but you pay in performance a lot. And yeah, CFI is, I, I like the concept. Uh, let's not talk about it today, but it, I like the concept. It doesn't fully solve the problem, sadly. Coco Bolo writes, uh, once you know the basic wounds and have done a lot of CTF problems, how do you start with real world bug hunting? How to not get overwhelmed with large code bases? Um, just start. Yeah, just go and start. Uh, how to not get overwhelmed with large code bases. Uh, basically, split the problem into parts. Do not look at the whole code base. Uh, try to like do, a, do an overview, like look around. What's, what are the inputs? What's the threat model of it? And what, because you know, for something to be a software vulnerability and not be a bug, there might, must be a, two different boundaries, like a security boundary between like a privileged user, for example, and an unprivileged user, an attacker, and this boundary must be crossed. Like the vulnerability must allow you to cross the software uh, security boundary. And um, for large, large code bases, I, was, I would try to understand how the threat model of that thing works. Threat model is an interesting thing, you should look it up. And um, what are the attack vectors? Attack vectors is the, it's basically at, an attack vector is uh, which ways an attacker can interact with a given thing which you're analyzing. For example, if this is like a service running as root and it has an interface using pipes, but pipe is your attack vector. And you have to enumerate these attack vectors because as an attacker, there are only limited ways you can interact with a given thing, right? 
and um, yeah, as such, you usually enumerate the attack vectors, and then only you say, okay, I'm going to look at this specific attack vector, and suddenly most of the code base stops being relevant for you. You only care about where your attack vector is leading and what what parts of the code are interacting with your attack vector because you cannot reach other parts of code anyway. Like for example, there is a config parser and that only parses trusted configs from a given directory. This is not your attack vector. You do not have to care about that parser. You don't have to care about that code. If there is again this pipe API, which is you can like from another user, you can actually interact with it. That is your attack vector. You should focus on that. So try to figure out like split the problems into smaller parts and focus only on these parts and attack vector enumeration is one of these uh, of these things to do. Uh, Nurika Be writes, what is your stance regarding trying to reverse ng reverse commercial protectors? Those are also sometimes used to obfuscate malware, forcing malware researchers to be able to work with that. I think you answered your own question. If malware uses something or has the ability to use something, uh, as a malware researchers, you have to know how to break it. Like, that's it. Like, there is no no additional magic here. Uh, you should obviously not write cracks and release cracks for games unless uh, you want to get in trouble or this is the thing which actually uh, you like to do, right? But it, it might get you in trouble. Be careful. Talk to your lawyer. <laughs> Again, this is a stream about ethical hacking. And... Um, but yeah, if a malware uses a protection, you can break it, you, you should break it, and you can describe how to break it for other malware researchers because, yeah. Uh, and like, nobody can, can say you, you did a bad thing. In all honesty, after like years of reverse engineering, like, dear game developers, stop doing, wasting your time on creating protections for your products, but like privacy protection, sorry, privacy, piracy protections that will not work. They will be bypassed. You're just wasting money. Thank you. <laughs> and you're just like, yeah, I saw like multiple issues with in the past where like uh, if you pirated a game, you could easily run it and it would work. If you would buy a game, it would, the protection systems would, would, would like break your system or like prevent you from playing because of reasons and the pirates could easily play the game. So yeah, game developers and like software developers should stop fighting with their clients and like making their life miserable in the name of of fighting the piracy, which actually doesn't work anyway. So unless they can actually find a way to make it work, which hasn't happened yet, but maybe it will happen someday. Who knows? It is an interesting game. Um and then name writes, what type of hacking do you do on your current job? I do a vulnerability research on internal software stacks and a little bit on external software. That's the, what I currently do. In the past, in other places, I did also penetration testing. I did also malware analysis and I, would, I also did a protection, like which was mentioned in the previous question, uh, writing unpackers, static unpackers and unprotectors or deprotectors for available also sometimes commercial packers, which were used by malware. They were used by other software as well, but they were used also by malware. So I, yeah, and antiviruses had to have those. I'm pretty sure I also did other stuff, but that's basically the bulk of it. Uh, Hotmaster Gas20 writes, what are the starter jobs for people trying to get into InfoSec? It depends. It really depends. It's really hard to find a job as a secu offensive security researcher. It's easier to find a job as a malware analyst. It's easier to find in like uh, security operation centers doing, for example, intrusion detection and, um, and also like in penetration testing, I would say. But almost any job related to security is a, is an entry level job apart can have an entry level job related to it apart from maybe uh, security research like offensive security research. That's something that requires a little more knowledge, I guess, to get a job in it because so little jobs are there. Uh, I'm not sure about that though. That's like my feeling. It doesn't have to be like that. Yeah, I'm not a 
I do not look too much around the job market, so I have limited visibility, I would say. Kate writes, um, where should I look for an internship when I got the basic knowledge? Um, do not be afraid to send an email to a security company you know, asking if there are internships there. I know for a fact companies do not over advertise that, but if they get an email, they, uh, they are like, yeah, maybe, why not? And I know multiple people who got internships like that. So yeah, just like send an email to somebody in the company, uh, like the higher, the better. Um, if it's a large company, then don't go too high though. But, and, and ask like, is there an internship? Um, on the other side, if they're like super large companies like Facebook or Google or Microsoft, right? They have um, internship programs. So look on the websites, find an internship program and apply for it. Uh, for Google, the internship applications start in September, October. Um, I don't know for other companies. Mm. But yeah, these two things. Like, and companies, smaller companies do not advertise what they are doing internship. You, they, they don't even think about it. So if you send them an email, they might be like, yeah, let's, let's just create an internship for, for this person. But seriously happens, do that. And sometimes there are also like job fairs or like companies come to universities and like chat with students about doing internships. So that's fair. Um, Jacob writes, uh, I, I'm going to check how many questions there are. Okay, there are like not a lot of more questions. So I'm going to go through all of them, even though this kind of goes um, over the usual time limit. Uh, Jacob writes, what do you think? Uh, about cybersecurity degrees, I do not think anything about them because these are pretty new things. So, mm, yeah, so given that these are pretty new things, I do not, I do not have an opinion on them. It's great that universities started doing degrees like that. So, yeah, that's my opinion. <laughs> First question, why do I not uh, answer questions directly from YouTube? Because I, I have three different chats opened and I am trying to usually do something here, so I'm not looking at the YouTube chat. And uh, But if you write a question to Kshaku on the YouTube chat, it will get to my list. So I will answer the question from my list. Uh, and there is sometimes a lot of traffic on the on the chat, so, um, so I would just lose questions. And that way, I have my moderators there, like Kshaku, like Foxtrot, who are feeding the, like copying the questions which you have to my list. Mm. Uh, Guliame writes, Hi, I have a very specific question that is not related to what we are talking about. Uh, what is the calling convention for 32-bit ELF executable? I'm trying to uh, to do ROP and Ethereum and it confuses me. Uh, depends on the uh, architecture. But okay, since it's kind of on topic actually, so I'm going to answer, give you a different, an interesting answer. Go to, there's another amazing person, his name is Agner Fogg. Um, Agner like this and look for um, calling conventions. He has this amazing, absolutely amazing PDF with calling conventions for different architectures, different compilers and uh, on page 10, I believe. Yeah, there is this like how registers are used in some cases. So uh, check this paper out. This is usually what I refer to. And also Wikipedia has a surprisingly good article on that. Actually, there are a lot of really good articles on security and reverse engineering on Wikipedia. Uh, but I'm super surprised. Like people were did, did an amazing job about that. Uh, Mohammed writes, uh, do hackers nowadays use machine learning, deep learning for hacking? No. Uh, in general, no. These are like, these are heuristics and hacking kind of works in a different way. I know that, okay, uh, that being said, a lot of people are experimenting with trying to apply machine learning and deep learning and AI to security, but I have not yet seen anything convincing. There is new research coming out daily, uh, so maybe that will change currently. Yeah, because these are like basically, uh, like we, like, the, due to the way machine learning works, it's not really applicable for the problems we are trying to solve, for most of the problems. For some maybe, but not for all. Uh, well, almost for none, in all honesty. 
But there might be a day when somebody comes and says, yeah, um, I figured out you can apply machine learning to this problem and that might be pretty revo revolutionary. So I'm not saying that that's not going to happen. Uh, Nishant Kumar writes, bug bounty versus ethical hacking versus pen testing. Pen <laughs> okay, uh, please explain. Uh, I will also add red teaming to that because, uh, so yeah, bug bounty is basically, um, there are companies like HackerOne, uh, which are aggregates for us, but I'm going to go for Google Bug Bounty. Uh, program rules, here we go. It's basically a vulnerability reward program, where if you find a vulnerability on one of these services, like an XSS or like some other type of vulnerability, and report it responsibly to Google, you might get a monetary award. Might because it might not be a vulnerability at all. Uh, there are really smart people uh, in my team that are checking this. Uh, then uh, it might be already reported by somebody else. But if that's not the case, that's a real vulnerability, you will get money for that. Uh, how much? Depending on the vulnerability, it might be anything from like 100 bucks to like $20,000. And there are people doing actually living out of it. Like they just go between different companies and check with different websites and uh, and they get money for that. I also got um, some amounts, a five digit amounts of dollars for vulnerabilities reported to other companies. So yeah, it's not a scam, it actually works. If you go to my blog, there is like some Prezi posts, which I had, uh, which are like basically stories from some bug bounties and with some bugs I found. Uh, and usually the digger you deep, uh, the digger you deep, the deeper you dig into a given website, the mod more bugs you will find because um, yeah, that, re that requires more skills. So this is a bug bounty. Uh, basically, um, you report a bug according to the rules which are specified, important, very important, read the rules because otherwise you will be sad that you don't get an award because it's out of scope for some reason. Uh, read the rules and uh, you report a bug and you get money back. Uh, it usually takes a few months, but you get the money. So that's it uh, for bug bounties. Then we have ethical hacking. Ethical hacking is like hacking which is done in an ethical way, which means it's usually according to law. Um, and uh, you try not to, you try to help people. You tr don't hurt people, you try to help people and companies and do it in an ethical way, which is, um, yeah. usually it's the same thing as the law, but not always. Um, yeah, so that's eth ethical hacking. It's just like a global term for like everything. Um, yeah, with like basically what white hats do is what, that's ethical hacking. Then we have penetration testing. Penetration testing is a service. Um, a service where a company wants to test if their infrastructure is, is okay and like is it secure. So they go to a company which gives penetration testing services and they say, please hack us according to these rules um, and we will pay you money for that. And they will say, okay, we will assign for that money, we will assign five people for a week. And then these five people are hacking, uh, trying to hack into the company through the, uh, well, through that week. Uh, they usually try to either get like tested as much as possible, but find multiple vectors to to uh, get into the company, like to in get into the servers, get into the systems, like hack the websites, whatever, right? Everything according to the established rules. Usually sysadmins of that companies are not filled into, so they have no idea. And they're also kind of tested if they will detect the attackers. Um, that's the best way to, to actually do it. Uh, if they don't detect, that's fine. That just means that, yeah, maybe you need some more systems in place. And at the end, the result of that is a report, which uh, and sometimes it's also working with the company, with the sysadmins, with the developers to fix the defenses of that company, to fix the bugs which were discovered, to introduce new defenses, introduce new detection methods. Uh, this is the outcome of it. The company at the end of the day is more secure. So bug bounty and like penetration testing, um, which one should you choose as a company? Both, because they're different. You should choose both. Uh, that's, the, that's the bottom line of it. Um, bug bounty is you are not hired, you just opportunistically find a bug and get money for it. Penetration test, you are hired to actually do that job and you spend all your time doing that job. 
uh, but you are an external company. And then there is red team. Red team Red teams are basically doing the same thing as penetration testing companies, but they are internal teams doing the hacking exercises only on the given company that they are employed for. So yeah, there we go. Any good resources to start with Linux kernel exploitation? Ac good question, excellent question, but I do not have any good resources for that. So uh, what I would do is I would probably try to look for any descriptions of vulnerabilities um, like write-ups for vulnerabilities and for research related to that. Start from that and also learn like how to get symbols for the kernel, how to work with a debugger with a kernel, and then how to start applying fuzzers to a kernel. And what, what research has already been done in the subject, what other researchers used, that is what I would focus on. And also learn the techniques, like in these write-ups what you're looking for is like techniques, how do I actually exploit a buffer overflow in the kernel uh, to get code execution with root privileges, for example, right? This is a question which you should ask, and then you should look for resources for that, but I do not have any good links, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I just don't. <laughs> uh, Chopper writes, um, uh, you said web security had good job opportunities and binary exploitation hasn't. Uh, I, I said that there, like, is, there are less jobs in binary exploitation. What about reverse engineering? Uh, good question. Reverse engineering is interesting because um, reverse engineering is sometimes needed even in game localization, meaning that uh, game localization is being like you get a game from a publisher and you want to translate it to, I don't know, Polish, for example, but the publisher is like, yeah, I'm not giving you source code. So you're like, okay, so how am I to, supposed to translate it? And there are job opportunities there for reverse engineers, but they're actually translating it. Like, you know, trying to extract the text, give it to a translator, and then the translator is translating it, and then the reverse engineer puts the text back in the game. Same with images and so on, which have to have, I don't know, some um, like names on textures fixed or whatever. So this is one job opportunity there. Then we have malware analysis, then reverse engineering is a tool in most of security. Uh, then we have um, like certs of different types, like computer emergency response teams. Uh, then we have um, also sometimes where like companies which are hired for to change something in a software used in a given company, which does not, uh, the, the creator of that software does not exist anymore. Think like if there's like, I don't know, like a... Um, uh, what's it called, like a storage, a cargo storage magazine, whatever, and you have an application which was bought in the 80s, uh, which handles that, but now suddenly it turns out that uh, the, I don't know, like tax things related to that changes, and therefore they need to fix the amount in the software, but the software has it hard-coded, so they need to hire somebody to actually change the software, that old legacy software, and and do that, and um, and yeah, and you need a reverse engineer for that. So yeah, there are multiple um, places where you can you can find employment as a reverse engineer. Uh, engineer, I would say. Uh, I've yeah. Uh, that being said, there aren't that many jobs for engineers as there are like reverse engineers as there are for programmers. Programming is way more popular, and there there is way more demand on the market for that. So do take that into account as well. But thankfully, there aren't that many people interested in reverse engineering. So yeah. Um, okay, uh, or a subfield like hardware or IoT firmware and electronics reverse engineering. Um, I guess these subfields are more going into security research-ish, though hardware reverse engineering and electronics reverse engineering, but kind of like goes also into the like, we are a company and the competitor did this, maybe we want to reverse it and create our own product like that. Uh, there might be job opportunities there as well. How ethical is that and how lawful is that is a different discussion, of course. Um, yeah, then we have another question. So what's the minimum level of binary exploitation skills in order to be considered at least a junior researcher, the ability to find real-world security hole at least? Yes, the ability to find a real-world bug and exploit it and write a good write up about it. I would say that's that what gets you into, like if it's an easy vulnerability, that would get you into the junior level. Uh, if it's a, like, if you find that vulnerability in Chrome and you actually try and find vulnerab five vulnerabilities, 
uh, to get like a remote code execution, basically, that gets you way higher than the junior level, though. Way higher. Okay, Vertex writes, uh, about papers, publications, um, I'm quite new in hacking community. Is Packetstorm still reputable? Yeah, absolutely. Packetstorm has been around for ages, for, for as long as I remember. Um, that, I guess also like uh, there is the um, open source security mailing list, OSS, OSS security, something like that. Uh, then there is the full disclosure and uh, there was also back backtrack, was it? The, uh, the other mailing list. Anyway, yeah, Packetstorm, absolutely. Mm. So yeah, uh, Packetstorm is another thing I'd recommend. There are probably also some really good news sites which are about technical security. Try to find these. Uh, Paradox Exploit writes, is Go used a lot for different things that um, needs to be secure, like crypto or C the most used? Okay, uh, Go is gaining popularity. I don't think it's as popular as Rust is, but it's gaining popularity. Um, and it's also used where for things which need to be more secure. C isn't a language I would choose for writing secure stuff. Um, so yeah, C is an C, C++, PHP, JavaScript. These aren't these are languages where it's super easy to make a mistake, and I would not choose these languages for making secure applications unless you really know what you're doing. And yeah, I, I have seen Go used in such places. It's not super popular, but it is being used in such places. What's the situation on the market related to Linux malware analysis? I have absolutely no idea. And I'm not sure there is a lot of malware for Linux. Yeah, there will be a lot of malware for Linux as soon as Linux becomes a viable operating system for desktops and yeah. I know it is, but uh, let's be honest, like not a lot of people are using it. Like don't think about your colleague developers or sysadmins, think about like the general population. Not a lot of people are using uh, Linux apart from enthusiasts still, sadly, but still, yeah. So yeah, there is no, not a lot of malware there. Navras writes, uh, how does a company know um, that you know what you're doing? I mean, how can I show a company my skills, CTFs, projects, if uh, projects, what kind of projects, excellent questions. I will have a blog post about it soon on my blog. I have this for ages on my Polish blog, but uh, I actually asked a translator to translate it to publish it finally in English. So watch my blog, but basically everything which you said and uh, like projects, CTFs, publications, talks at conferences, open source tools, involvement with open source tools. Uh, yeah. Like everything which makes sense and is cool, you can show as proof that, that this is what you know what you're doing. But again, in, in a couple of days, there will be a blog post about it, like with enumerated a lot of things which you can put in your resume. Mohammed writes, uh, not a question, but thanks for the live stream. It's informative and intellectual. Thank you for the kind words as well. Sparky Parrot writes, Bug bounty, ethical hacking, and testing and testing. What kind of uh, salary scale one could expect from one to two years to ten years experience? Would it be more like a financial consultant, an MD, a journalist? Uh, depends really on the country and on the company. I would say that security people earn slightly more than programmers on the same level. And that can go really high. Really, really high. Uh, like yeah, like if you're really good, six level salary, six digit salaries are not uncommon. Uh, but that has to be a good company and um, and yeah. So I'm not sure how many, how much actually financial consultant or a medical doctor earns. I'm pretty sure the salaries are more than journalists. So, uh, but like, don't ask me, go to Glassdoor. There is a site called Glassdoor where you can check what are the, what are like, what is the market paying for a given job. So yeah, look at a given, and you know, the, it also depends from country to country, right? Like from Poland, the salaries are smaller than in Switzerland, for example, but that's, that's how the local market works. So it, it will depend on the, on the company, on the region, and also on the, on the, com, 
the company as well, sorry, the country, the company, the level you are at, and uh, like multiple other things. But salaries are pretty decent, actually. I, I would say like really decent. I'm not sure how much a medical doctor earns, though. So I don't know. I need to check, I think, on Glassdoor. <laughs> no, they are not sponsoring this video. And the last question, what about fuzzing? Is it mandatory to know how to customize fuzzers? Yes, yes, uh, absolutely yes. If you are just applying a fuzzer out of a box, it will not give you good results. You have to know what you're doing and how to improve your fuzzer. Uh, this is key. Um, uh, or do you even know how to write a custom one? Uh, fuzzers are simple. And yeah, you should know how to write a, a fuzzer. Uh, for and um, for specific software using techniques like taint analysis, symbolic execution, uh, these two, I guess, are like a little more advanced. But you should be able to to quite fast, like quite early in your journey, write a simple dump fuzzer and then a genetic fuzzer. Genetic fuzzers aren't rocket science. They are once you understand how they work, you should be able to write one if you know you have decent programming skills. Now, taint analysis is a uh, that's more of a pain, and um, yeah, and symbolic execution is a totally different thing, uh, which uh, which can aid a fuzzer really greatly, but uh, it's also I would say an advanced thing. But there are like cool li libraries and tools to do that already. So yeah, but know what you're doing always, including fuzzers, including tools like fuzzers. Like AFL is amazing if you know how to properly use AFL, how to improve the fuzzing results, you will get better results any, regardless. Um, how to get hired as a security engineer at Google, how to prepare for the interview. You have to, so there have to be openings and security teams, obviously, and then you have to apply for the job. Um, yeah, and then after you do that, if your resume goes through the initial screening, but by the way, the, the website is like careersgoogle.com, something like that, look for security there, yeah. And you can click apply and then send in your resume. Uh, now, for when the interviewing process starts at Google, it depends from company to company. At Google, it might be one to two phone screens and then two to five on-site interviews. Currently, that would be remote interviews due to the situation again. Um, yeah, and then you there might be like additional steps. I, for example, had to send in my university grades uh, and then I had to send three references from different people uh, about me so basically like you know like a typical reference uh yeah and how to prepare for the interview uh, everything you're learning you're preparing for the interview i don't think there is especially for a security engineer um do ctfs do manual work publish things that's the best preparation you can get do not specifically try to game the interview that will that will be super hard to do um which resources can you advise uh, apart from Pwnable KR? Uh, just doing hard CTFs and trying to target real world software. Uh, yes, apart from Pwnables, like go to uh, Wechal, Wechal.net, and here there is this like sites, and there are a lot of other sites apart from Pwnable, uh, Pwnables, which you can test yourself. But um, yeah, remember that like CTFs and war games are just uh, these are like fun stuff, fun competitions, but also focus on the real world software. Uh, like, yeah, don't. It's, in all honesty, sometimes it's way easier than CTF problems. Yeah, sometimes it's not, but sometimes, like, there are applications which, like, you're just like, like, yeah, on a CTF, this would be a problem for 50, 50 points. It's like, they have like obvious bugs here, here, and here, and like, it's super easy to exploit. CTFs are harder than real world software. Remember that. Um, which box, uh, books from Chris Kaspersky have you read and which can you recommend? I've read the, uh, from Nezumi, I read uh, Hacker Disassembly Uncovered, I believe, that's the English name, which I, it's outdated, but I still would recommend looking at it. They're kind of outdated for obvious reasons. Uh, sadly, uh, Chris Kaspersky is no longer with us. But uh, yeah, look at his publications, they're awesome uh, regardless. When I was learning reverse engineering, his book was one of the things, one of the resources I really valued. What's your 
opinion about companies like Zerodium. Uh, can please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're buying vulnerabilities for some reason, right? Uh, I think they're like depends on the company really, but they're like kind of in the gray area. Um, Yeah, they do have some amazing publications. Though. Thomas writes, uh, do you write notes in Cherry Tree, Jupyter Notebook, Google Notebooks or something else? I use Google Docs for that mostly. Mm, yeah, but you can use whatever you want. Doesn't matter. Uh, Thomas writes again, uh, can you recommend some books papers about finding bugs in CPUs? I don't think there are any books about that subject yet. As for papers, um, like start with the initial one by Jan Horn, uh, with what started the whole mess we are in now, right? Uh, so start with that one, then also look on Project Zero's blog, where both Jan and then recently Stefan Rodger published stuff. And then also look on Google Scholar for like Spectre Meltdown, uh, you will get papers which link to them. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how I would do it. I think there are also websites which actually enumerate all the CPU bug papers which were, which were published. Paradox Exploits writes, what's the difference between a security engineer and a penetration test? And security engineer might, it's, a, it's a, like a global term. Uh, for example, uh, security engineers at, in my team, they do code reviews, like security code and design reviews for new products. So even before the product is deployed and ever a penetration tester could see it, they already work with uh, team which, make, which is, ma is making it to make it secure. So that might be one thing that a security engineer does, but a security engineer is like a, a, it's a large term. They might also do other things. They also might do penetration testing and they also might do uh, like um, write, like analyze malware or, or they might do stuff like doing forensics analysis, like uh, after things being owned, they do analysis of that. Uh, ev every one of these people would be called a security engineer. So a penetration tester uh, is uh, is a specific thing, like in that larger bug, which is called security engineering. Niklas writes, uh, what do you prioritize when getting familiar with a code base you plan to find vulnerabilities in? This kind of goes back to what I already talked. Enumerate the attack vectors. Get an overview, think what is the threat model, and enumerate attack vectors and focus on the attack vectors. This is what I would prioritize on. Which, where do I have like access to as an attacker? Thomas writes, how often browser zero days are used in the wild for masses? Is it still a common as in early days for with flash players? Uh, it's not as common because most of the browsers now have some annoying sandboxes and so on. So yeah, so where we have it. Um, it still happens from, it's not as, it is not as popular as it was back in the days, but it still happens from time to time. I don't know exactly the statistics, I think you'd have to look for like Chrome zero day in the wild. I think there is like at least one or two every year. Did you read practical binary analysis book? Um, I did not. It's the one from No Start, right? Yeah, it's, I, I have not read it. I think I have it somewhere on my shelf though. Uh, which books can you recommend for improving binary analysis skills mainly in Linux? I have no idea. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just don't, don't know. I rarely read technical books. I use them mostly for inspiration, which is weird. I know, but that's how I am. Navros writes, uh, when did you start in this field? It's to give me hope. Okay. I started programming when I was six. I started, that was 30 years ago. I started into security 15 years ago, like professional security. I'm not sure how much hope that will give you, but here we go. Uh, Idi writes, uh, I'm going to do three more questions I'm going to finish since we already have an hour after um, that. But if you have any more questions, just put them in the comments under the video. What resources and projects or projects to gain some more understanding about browser security and finding bugs in Chromium? Um, I'm only aware of Cure 53 and X51 white papers and the Tangled Web. Uh, good resources, absolutely. Uh, read the write-ups for existing found previously vulnerabilities and start digging into Chrome and so on. Um, from what I've heard from people who are doing browser security is that it's scary at the beginning, but once you get into it, it's like, it's fine. So start doing it, I guess, is the, is the 
best thing I can tell you. I do not know any good resources. I would look for write-ups about pre-existing vulnerabilities or rather vulnerabilities which were published in the past. Thomas writes, are you familiar with article from Corolan about honeypot accident uh, where they catch the browser exploit in the white? Is this something which is still doable nowadays? Honeypots, yeah, sometimes I find vulnerabilities, but um, and I didn't read that article, though I kind of net, I get the concept. I have some honeypots there, like here and there as well to find some attackers from time to time, but uh, for old days, yeah, it could happen. Old days are a funny thing, right? Because like people try to use old days really cautiously. And most things that malware uses is not old days, it's like what vulnerabilities which should be already patched and are even already patched, but like they just target en masse, right? Uh, and like people who did not patch. Um, yeah, but I think it still can happen but people are trying to be really careful with how they use an O-Day before they burn it. Because once you use an O-Day, you burn it. That's how it goes. It stops being an O-Day, right? Uh, Francisco, Joao Francisco writes, uh, Joao, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have no idea how to say that. Or how is it? Francisco, I'm going to say Francisco. How do you find a team and how is it the, how's the process of joining a team? How does that apply to how I, how, to how I joined Dragon Sector. I didn't join Dragon Sector, I created Dragon Sector. Uh, it was basically that I found ctftime.org and I was like, yeah, I, I really like rankings, okay? So I was like, I emailed Yuru, like Mateusz Jurczyk, and I say, hey, there's a ranking. And he's like, yeah, we're making a team. So uh, then we invited Adam Ivaniuk, another person, and uh, I used two heavy metal band name generators or whatever to come up with a Dragon Sector name. And that's how we started the team, basically. Um, uh, yeah, so that's one way you can do it. You can just start a team, especially if you know some colleagues that might be interested in, in playing CTFs with you. Now, uh, what is the process of joining an existing team? Send an email and ask them. It depends from team to team. There are teams which are like only for a given university and you have to be a student for that university. Uh, there are teams which, um, like, if you were to join Dragon Sector, there are some prerequisites. One of them is actually you need to speak fluent Polish because we tried communicating in English, but did not work. So we settled that, yeah, we, we need to, like, everyone needs to speak in Polish. doesn't matter what nationality they are, but they need to speak fluent Polish. So, yeah, I know that that's a hard rule, but it, it is a decision we had to make. Uh, because the communication otherwise did, just did not work if we tried doing it in English. And uh, yeah, so and then and assuming you know that, it would be you have to um, play with us as a guest and, uh, and exploit during a couple of CTFs uh, challenges which are considered hard, like 400, 500 points and are interesting technically. If you do that, yeah, you get an invitation. Thank you for the stream. Thank you, Dashin, as everyone else for being here. Uh, thank you to my moderators. Sorry for uh, doing that. Um, for like being too long, extending the stream for too long. And I guess um, happy hacking. Good luck. And read all the links I gave you at the beginning of the stream. Like these are super smart people. They know what they're talking about and figure out the way for yourself at the end. Yeah, use your brain. Uh, so yeah, um, that's it. See you next week on the 100th live stream. And uh, I'm going to leave you with some music. So bye bye.